Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmisano, and I'm the Chair of Committee of the Whole. I'll call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, December 5th. I'll note that it's our last Committee of the Whole of the year, and it's a very full agenda. So I'll, at this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wamsley. Present. Rainville. Present. Vita. Present. Ellison. Here. Osman. Present. Goodman. Present. Jenkins. Present. Chugtai. Present. Koski. Present. Chowdhury. Present. Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. There are 13 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Um, we have five items on our published agenda in addition to reports of committees that have met this cycle. We'll begin with our first public hearing, uh, which is to receive and file public comment regarding appointments to our ethical practices board. Uh, that those people selected are both Michael Friedman and Mark Wagner. I'll note that our official role as a council in this process is only to hold the hearing. We do not vote on these appointments. And to introduce this item, we have Assistant Attorney Susan Trammell um, to speak about it. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, members of the committee. Uh, today, the appointing committee for the Ethical Practices Board is bringing forward two finalists. They are here today to give a brief statement and then open for public comment. The process is such that the ethics code requires that uh, the appointing panel bring forward and open a public comment period of 30 days. That period opened on the 21st of November with the letter that was sent to the council members and it's been also posted on in finance and commerce and also on the city's ethical practices board website inviting comment. Any comment received for the 30 days will be forwarded to the appointing committee along with comments received today at which time they will make their final decision as to the appointments. So today this council's uh, or the committee's action will be to receive and file any public comment and I invite um, for our first applicant, who is Mark Wagner, to uh, appear before you and make a few comments. And then um, Michael Friedman will also, uh, an appointee who is being recommended as a re reappointment to make just a couple comments. Thank you. I'll officially open the public hearing and invite up um, Mr. Mark Wagner. Welcome, Mr. Wagner. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council members. My name is Mark Wagner. I've been a resident of Minneapolis for 17 years, a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School, and a member of the bar in good standing for 14 years. Um, and I was really just looking for a way to give back a little bit to the community that I love. And uh, I saw this opportunity advertised in um, one of the local uh, bar journals, and it stood out to me as a way that I might be able to make use of some of my skills to contribute to um, the good governance of the city, and I hope that I will be able to do that. Thank you. Mr. Friedman, if you'd also like to say a few words, and then we'll take anybody else that might speak, just so that people know if you're here to speak for the Ethical Practices Board, um, there's currently nobody signed in, so you will be up next. Welcome, okay. Mr. Friedman. Yeah, thank you, Chair Palmisano and members of the City Council. I don't really have any prepared remarks beyond what I put in the application. I've served for two years now on the Ethical Practices Board, and it is an investment in uh, ethical practices in the city, and the city has put forward a lot of effort in helping me to be trained and to adhere to the goals of the of the ethical practices as best as possible, and I've committed a substantial amount of time to that. Uh, my personal background is that I am not an attorney. I spent 15 years as the executive director of the Legal Rights Center, which is a local uh, community-founded nonprofit, um, and I also am currently on the Lawyers Prof Professional Responsibility Board. I've done that for four years. And so, and quite a while ago, for a few years in the early 2000s, I was the chair of the Civilian Review Authority Board here in Minneapolis. 
And so it's very important that when the public has some sense that something has gone wrong and there's a mechanism that government has put forward for complaint, that there's a fair process both for those who are making the complaint and those that the complaint is against. And uh, it is part of my ethical duty and personal goals to do the best I can to achieve that fairness for all concerned. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak in this public hearing? Would anyone like, else like to speak to this item? If not, I will close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Wagner, Mr. Friedman, we really appreciate your time and dedication uh, to the city. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? I'm not seeing any, so seeing no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to receive and file these comments. Thank you for your time. Our second public hearing today is a consideration of the mayor's nomination of Director Margaret Anderson Kelleher to the appointed position of City Operations Officer for a term ending January 2026. Here's how I'd like to run this. Um, first, I'll ask the mayor to introduce his nominee. Then we'll have the public speak to that nominee. Uh, third, we'll ask the nominee to speak if she'd like to say a few words, and then we'll have comments and conversation up here. So um, I imagine the mayor is running down the hall right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he is. Good Adam Vice quick. President, while you're waiting for the mayor to appear, I might just point out the agenda or points out that this is an appointment to the position of city operations officer and we did include parenthetically city coordinator. You'll all understand and appreciate that the reason for that is because under the city charter, it still references the city coordinator, um, although the ordinance is adopted by this body to implement the new government structure referred to a city operations officer. So it is a concurrent appointment to the two separate positions which are merged into one. And so um, just to point out that that's why it still references the position city coordinator. Thank you for that clarification. Mayor Fry, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, given that you're calling on me, I assume we're uh, at the point in time when we're bringing forward a nomination. Your nominee. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the City Council. Today is a day uh, that we get uh, the privilege of talking about someone who has been incessantly involved in government and community affairs for so many decades. Uh, this is a person in Margaret Anderson Keller who, who has uh, had at her heart a willingness to build consensus uh, bridge gaps and find partnerships where they're hard to find. Uh, that is what we need right now in this city. I can give you uh, a long soliloquy uh, about her uh, CV. I can tell you about all of the items on her resume that make her uniquely qualified to do this job and do it exceedingly well. Uh, but the bottom line is that right now we need partnership in the city and Margaret Anderson Kelleher can help bring it. Uh, she's someone that has had, uh, just to list a few accomplishments uh, during the uh, time she's been at Public Works. Uh, she's led the street reconstruction in downtown in North Minneapolis in conjunction with the Upper Harbor Terminal Project. She has partnered with Hennepin County to re-envision safety and transportation needs on East Lake Street, uh, and she has managed the overhaul of the city's stormwater tunnel system. Uh, and last year, when Minneapolis saw its third snowiest winter on record, uh, Ms. Anderson Kelleher directed the city to open free public parking during snow emergencies to ensure that residents could store their cars safely. Throughout the snow emergencies, Ms. Anderson Kelleher went above and beyond to communicate with city staff and residents about the critical weather circumstances that we were experiencing and making sure that they got all of the information that they needed to know. Once the snow melted, of course, Public Works wasted no time in getting out there to start filling the potholes, which, by the way, we had more in 2023 than in any year in recent history. And so many of us are also familiar with the accomplishments from Margaret Anderson Kelleher far before she got to this city, uh, including representing Minneapolis in the state legislature for 12 years, a portion of which uh, as a speaker of the House. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that we are joined by a, a number of really incredible leaders from both the House uh, and the Senate. Uh, there may be more, but at the very least, I see former Senator Jeff Hayden, Senator Scott Dibble, and Representative Frank Hornstein here with us. Uh, their presence uh, 
uh, and their work uh, for uh, the city of Minneapolis and our shared constituents shows how important the work that Margaret Anderson Kelleher has been doing now for decades. Uh, and just to add a few more, uh, she has served as the MnDOT commissioner, leading top state infrastructure projects like Highway 14 and 12, creating safer roads for communities across the state. Uh, and then beyond her role as a public servant, uh, she has a commitment to dedication uh, and dedication to our city uh, and to our communities, uh, of which she, by the way, is a resident. Uh, so this is someone who I am so proud to bring forward, especially at this point in time. Uh, Members of the city council, both brand new uh, and uh, those that have been around for a term or two, uh, we are at a critical juncture right now where we have an opportunity to start afresh. We have an opportunity to build partnerships where they've been frayed, uh, and I believe that Margaret Anderson Kelleher is the right person to do exactly that. So I really thank you for your time. I ask for your support uh, and your vote. Uh, and uh, Council Vice President, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Council Members. Thank you for these words. Um, we had first two members of the public signed in, and then we have some others, as you mentioned, from the audience. The first is Howard Dotson, the second is Meg Tuthill, and then in this order we have Representative Frank Hornstein, Chief Tyner, Kim Collins, Jeff Hayden, and Senator Scott Dibble. If you are here to speak on behalf of this nominee, or, to, or rather at this public hearing, pardon me, um, please do make sure to sign in over there at the clerk. Um, thank you and welcome, Mr. Dobson. Mayor Fry, council members, I think I missed my calling. I should have been a cheerleader because I've been to many of your nominations. I've watched you build a dream team. And as a son of Minneapolis, I'm so proud to see the changes that I've seen these last 15 months. Chief O'Hara uh, reminded us that we all went through this trauma together and the healing and reconciliation work is still ongoing. And these last 15 months I've watched Margaret, she's, she walks the talk. She has a servant's heart and she listens. And I always had confidence in, in what she heard she was gonna follow through on. I want to thank Heather Johnston for her service. I saw her at so many key meetings, and so the baton's being passed, but I know that the team you built and her experience and everything in front of us is going to help us get to that point where the healing and reconciliation actually can bring us to the next point. I've, watching the city go through this these last three years and seeing the team and that she can bring another dimension to it so with the third precinct and the community safety with judge barnett i'm i'm really i've never been so proud and hopeful for the city so thank you mayor thank you margaret thank you, thank you. next we have there we are I didn't see you back there. Uh, next, we have Meg Tuthill. Again, if you're here to speak at this public hearing, if you could please sign in over on that side of the dais. Welcome. Hello, Madam Chair and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. First of all, I also want to thank Heather Johnston for her service to the city of Minneapolis. I had the pleasure to work with her. She was just a delight and really helped somebody who wasn't great with figures, and I'm that person. Margaret Anderson Callaher, how the heck do I know her? We're gonna start with the fact I knew her before she was married. I've known her a long time. I've known her as one of her constituents. I've known her as a colleague. I've known her as a community person. I have found her to be ethical, hardworking, and for lots of us out here that are not in government and not working, She's a listener. May not always agree with her, but she's willing to listen. And as a colleague, I found the same thing. Those, things are re those qualities are really important. You, you can disagree, but let's listen to one another. And I, that's one of the things I like the most about her. Plus the fact she's not afraid to reach out to people who know about a situation more than she does. She is more than willing to do best practices. She's more than willing to learn from other people who have gone before her. These are qualities that are so important, especially in this day and age, 
and as we're trying to rebuild our city. So, Mayor Fry, thank you very much for the nomination. Margaret, thank you for your willingness to serve one more time. And to all of you, I hope that you will take a serious look at her nomination because it is for the betterment of our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Representative Frank Hornstein. Just to say, after him, we'll have Chief Tyner, Deputy Commissioner Kim Collins, Jeff Hayden, Senator Dibble, and then whoever else signs in over here. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's good to see all of the council here. Um, I've known uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher almost as long, not quite as long as Meg Tuttle, but it was 1993, and I was an organizer for a group called Clean Water Action. I didn't know much about the Capitol, but we uh, had a campaign to reduce mercury emissions from coal plants and garbage incinerators. And our work took us to the Capitol, and our key ally there was Representative, then Representative Jean Wagenius. And Margaret was the legislative ass assistant for Representative Wagenius. She helped me in ways I still value today in navigating that strange place called the Capitol. Fast forward four, uh, uh, 10 more years, and we're both representing the same uh, Senate district in uh, Minneapolis. Again, she takes me under her wings, teaches me how to bring people together and work for the betterment of the community. And then, four years after that, in 2007, I get to vote for her for Speaker of the House. And that's where I really saw her skills in action. We had a diverse group of people in our caucus, urban and rural, that she was able to bring together that we could work for uh, common goals. And then she had to deal with the Republican governor, Tim Pawlenty, and we were able to, to succeed in that as well, overriding his veto for a historic transportation bill, which brought money to Minneapolis for public transit and other needs. And then 2018, I get to work with her once more as the commissioner of transportation, same thing working together, reaching common ground, bringing people from diverse perspectives uh, to get things done in a very, very difficult environment of divided government. So for those reasons and so many more, I'm proud and I'm honored to support the nomination of Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Thank you so much. Next we have Chief Tyner. Chief. Chair Palmasano, members of the committee, uh, I am happy today to come up here and speak in favor of uh, Margaret Anderson Keller uh, becoming our next uh, COO. Uh, I remember when I first met her, uh, she was still the commissioner uh, with the state and uh, we had had a horrific accident uh, on 35W, uh, a car had ran into the uh, you know, bus lane thing they got there and, pretty much exploded and I got a call about 2.30 in the morning and uh, you know, it said, uh, Chief Tyner, this is Margaret Anderson Keller, I'm the commissioner of, you know, da -da -da -da, and I need to know what happened. And, and at 2.30 in the morning, I was, you know, thinking, who, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sounds familiar. But anyways, uh, so <laughs> I described to her what had happened and what was going on and what the damages were to the infrastructure uh, which luckily weren't much, and and uh, I think we went on from there. Uh, fast forward when she got here, uh, she's really been a good partner. The mayor mentioned uh, a partner. She's been a good partner in the fire department uh, in uh, designing uh, streets and thoroughways, and in at least one case, redesigning <laughs> a street or thoroughway, and that's, that's something that really hasn't happened uh, in the history of the fire department for us to have that partnership with Public Works. Uh, last year during the second snowiest uh, snowfalls on record uh, going to the one-sided parking. Uh, she did that because the fire department asked her to do that. So so uh, it's been a really good partnership. I, I'd like to see that partnership uh, continue. I think her resume speaks for itself. And so I'd like to speak in support of, of Margaret Anderson Kelleher becoming our next COO. And before I leave, I would also like to take a moment to thank uh, Heather Johnston for her work uh, over the years. I think she's done a great job for us and, and I hope that does not go unnoticed. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Deputy Commissioner Kim Collins. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Kim Collins, and I am a lifelong resident of the city of Minneapolis, and I also currently serve as the deputy commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. It is truly a privilege to be here today to speak on behalf of Director Margaret Anderson Kelleher as the next city operations director for Minneapolis. I'll start by saying I first met uh, Margaret, for me, she's my, my former commissioner, and so if I slip up and I refer to her as such, please forgive me. Uh, but I, I first met her when she joined MnDOT as the commissioner back in 2019, and I quickly learned that we have a few things in common, but most importantly was our fondness for our fair city. At the, as a civil rights director at the time, I had a strong need for a commissioner who uh, understood diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, the basis of our civil rights program, and most importantly, was willing to stand up and take a leadership role in advancing these programs. Margaret did not disappoint. It was an honor to uh, work under her leadership, and I'd even say her mentorship. Uh, it's, it's always wonderful when she calls me a colleague. Uh, I was most impressed with her steadiness in leading on challenging subjects, you know, she certainly shepherded the organization through the days following the killing of George Floyd and the civil unrest, which, as we all know, was a significant event for our city. When I learned that the commissioner uh, was resigning from MnDOT, I have to admit I was disappointed that I would no longer have the opportunity to serve under her leadership. However, inside, I unabashedly was absolutely thrilled with excitement that she was joining the city of Minneapolis, and I knew that I would be able to depend on her soundness of leadership uh, that would carry forward those same skills and characters of a phenomenal leader that I had experienced at uh, MnDOT. So thank you again. Thank you. Next, Mr. Jeff Hayden. I just saw him. There you are. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members uh, of the City Council. It's so good to see all of you here today. My name is Jeff Hayden, and um, I am a former state senator, uh, and currently I work in government relations at Fredrickson. Uh, not Fredrickson and Byron, just Fredrickson. I don't know where Mr. Byron went to. Um, at any rate, um, I'm here uh, just to make sure uh, that you understood my support of Margaret Anderson Kelleher as your next COO and why. Um, when I joined the legislature, I was elected in 2008 uh, and started in 2009, and uh, Margaret was the Speaker of the House. Um, and as many of you know, if you've gone over there, that's a pretty big job and a pretty big place and pretty in 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 intimidating. And as some of the folks that are here that are new, uh, that, that, that saying, uh, you're drinking water uh, out of a fire hose or hydrant or whatever it was, was absolutely true there. Um, I had had some uh, experience in working in politics as an aide uh, to city council member Gary Shift and uh, spent a, 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 lot, a little time with Council Member Goodman and uh, Madam President was, a, was an aide of Robert Lilligren. So I just want to say that I thought that I knew what I was doing, um, but I absolutely didn't. Um, and so I sat in the very back um, of the chamber and often when Margaret would come uh, off the dais, she would come and sit in the alcoves and she would uh, kind of sit and kind of take us under her, her wing and talk to us about what was going on and why and where and, and, and how things work and even was uh, gracious enough to refer us and the speaker doesn't necessarily give you bills but she can kind of send you on your way. And so I was able to really get some good opportunity, uh, Senator Champion and I, now the President of the Senate, um, working uh, with Margaret. Uh, but with my time left, I wanted to share one anecdote with you. Uh, as Margaret uh, transitioned to be the chair of MnDOT, um, the 35W project that many of us uh, serve and live next to that big $300 million project was being put in. It was near and dear to my heart because that's where my family uh, grew up. Um, and so I got a call from a Baptist minister who said, um, hey, this project is ruining uh, our church, that uh, there's cracks in the walls, there's things happening, the, it's inaccessible, and we don't know who to talk to. And when we call, uh, no one picks up the phone. And so with that, I called Margaret, and she picked up the phone on the first ring. 
Uh, we had a, lot, a good conversation. We brought her staff in. Uh, and needless to say, I know my time is up. We were able to rectify, help fix that church, help give it the uh, access that it's needed so that we didn't continue to give harm to a community that had been harmed by big transportation projects. So once again, I know my time is up. Um, I want to make sure that you know that uh, I support and a lot of members of the community support Margaret in this position as chief executive or chief operating officer for the city of Minneapolis. Thanks again. It's good to see all of you. Nice. Thank you very much. Next is Senator Scott Dibble. And then I'm just saying we don't have anybody else signed in. So unless that changes, you'll be our last speaker. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Members, uh, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to speak in favor of Margaret Anderson Kelleher's nomination to be the next operations officer for the city of Minneapolis. My name is Scott Dibble, and I serve as a Minnesota State Senator representing District 61 and chair of the Transportation Committee at the Senate. It also might be of interest to you that, like uh, uh, Jeff Hayden, I uh, served as a council aide uh, to city council member Dore Mead. Uh, several times preceding uh, Emily Kosky on the city council in the 11th ward. As speaker, Representative Anderson Kelleher's leadership was essential and key in passing the then long needed and awaited sustainable funding package of 2008, which required a bipartisan override of the governor's veto. And it was the first time our metropolitan area finally joined its peers in passing a sustainable, stable, and growing source of funding for transit. While serving as MnDOT's leader, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher was the most progressive, thoughtful, and responsive leaders at MnDOT I have ever had the pleasure of working with. She understands how our built environment can either add to greater racial, social, and economic justice and contribute to improving our environment and climate, or it can do the exact opposite. She established the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, ushering in key changes to MnDOT's policies and practices with regard to our environment and climate, key among them reducing vehicle miles traveled, and just as important, intentionally engaging an array of external experts, community members, and stakeholders in its work and in its decision making. As commissioner, she worked alongside me as the then minority lead, along with Chair Hornstein, bringing all of her skills and fostering personal relationships and finding ways for all parties to succeed. And in that bill, we advanced BRT projects, made the first time substantial investments in active transportation, made the second Amtrak train from Chicago possible, and advanced efforts to bring the Rondo neighborhood back together. Just one more paragraph, I'll be real fast. Among the many recent legislative successes is the passage of a once in a lifetime leap forward, the comprehensive, sustainable, progressive transportation package we just passed in this last session, more than half of the funding dedicated to transit and non-motorized transportation. Chair Hornstein and I asked her to come over and to help us with that bill, and she brought her considerable skill uh, to bear in bringing stakeholders together, sometimes hard to corral stakeholders, and so the success of that bill is attributable as much to her leadership as it is to anyone's. So she really did a fantastic job of reprising that leadership role that she has had had before. So I appreciate your consideration of Margaret Anderson Kelleher as the operating officer for the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Well, I don't think we've had any additional sign up, so I'll invite the nominee up to speak. And as she does um, get ready on the dais, I will, I'll just, I won't introduce everyone, but I just want to share with viewers that we have so many people here in the room. I see a number of public works staff, um, I presume here in support um, of, of this transition. I see directors and deputies of many other departments like Reg Services, the Office of Community Safety, um, MPD, Communications, um, Reg Services, and, um, and members of her family. Very important. <laughs> Thank you for coming over to be here today. Director Kelleher, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. And Council members. First, uh, I want to thank these colleagues, past and present, who've come forward today to speak on my behalf. I deeply appreciate that. Chief Tyner, as well as Representative Hornstein, Senator Dibble, Senator Hayden, and of course my friend and my valued colleague, Kim Collins, Deputy Commissioner at MnDOT, and Meg Tuttle, and Howard Dotson. Thank you for saying a few words. I want to thank Heather Johnston for her service in this role, both as coordinator and as COO. And I also want to say that I hope these comments um, 
can go out as our employees are watching, I am sure, most certain across the city to them as well. They're meant for all of you, but they're also meant for our residents and our people who work in Minneapolis. So um, I, I wanted to reflect on how I should begin with all of you. My last hearing was online. Uh, it, I think at that point it was the longest public hearing any uh, proposed department head had ever gone through. I think somebody else maybe has surpassed me now. But I thought it was important to reintroduce myself to all of you in a more personal way. I've been a resident of the city of Minneapolis for 34 years. In January, sorry. I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a spouse, I'm a mom, and a mom to two very independent, thoughtful adults. I'm a dog mom, which many of we bonded over that. I'm an artist in a number of mediums as well, and that's something you might not know about me. I've been on my neighborhood board. I served as a community organizer. You've heard I was a state representative, a leader in the legislature, a leader at a nonprofit, a leader in the state as a commissioner, and most recently, proudly as an employee of city, the city of Minneapolis. I have a master's degree in public administration. Sometimes we don't talk about that, but I want to share that with you. My areas of interest were budgeting, conflict resolution, both mediation and negotiation, as well as studying system dynamics. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I love the outdoors. I love to walk run slowly, kind of like a turtle. I like to cross-country ski on the easy course, and I love to fish. I will bring all of my lived experiences to this job. I want to thank each of you as council members. You have given me your time, and I know that many of you will be giving me more time out of your valuable day to have conversations. And not just the time, but the attention you spent with me to talk about what you hope for the role of COO in the city. I appreciate your desire to serve your ward and the residents of your ward, and we share that. That's my driving force, is to be able to deliver for our residents, our visitors, people who are temporarily in our city, to make sure we are doing this work excellently. I've dedicated my entire life to public service. Over the years, I've continued to and have chosen to stay in this arena. And I can wholeheartedly tell you that I love working at the city of Minneapolis. I've been here for less than two years, but that enthusiasm that I have for our work is a feeling that I just can't shake, and I hope I never shake that feeling. In our conversations, I heard from all of you. I heard themes of the work we can do together to improve the life for people in Minneapolis. The work to be able to reset relationships. The work to be able to get very specific about cross-collaboration between the office of public service and the Office of Community Safety and working with Commissioner Barnett and his team. We have hard work to do ahead of us. The agreement with MDHR, the future settlement agreement with the federal government, it'll take all of us working on these issues across these two departments. After the council had approved the changes to government structure last fall, I want to note we're one year into this. We're really one year into fully trying on and, and fitting into this new suit of clothes we have. And there have been ups and downs to that. We've had to navigate change. Sometimes we've done it together. Sometimes it feels a little apart. I think we can do better together. When we reflect on what we're dealing with, we're dealing with over 100 years of processes, 100 years of ways that people were working. 
And so to be able to make culture change, it, it's going to take a lot. And that came through in our conversations, that we need continued culture change within the city of Minneapolis. I'm wholeheartedly committed to that culture change. The COO, as a leader, has hard work ahead as well. And my vision for this role as COO in this time is kind of two parts, two big parts. Operational excellence, as well as making sure our work culture and values are strengthened and come through. We need to make sure that culture is anti-racist, anti-sexist. Anti we have to commit to those goals every single day. And that will help our very talented staff who's already here, and hopefully those we attract into the future, excel at their work on behalf of residents. As I noted before in our conversations, we also have, in my conversation with both the mayor, thank you, Mayor Fry, for the nomination, as well as conversations with individual council members, I've already diagnosed some of the things we have to be working on together. Overhauling community engagement at every level of the city enterprise so our residents are more included and so everyone can be heard. Being able to, again, reset that relationship between the legislative and executive branches and I think importantly, improvements to budgeting, our human resource systems. We have an excellent leader there. We need to listen to that leader, but we also need to keep pushing reform. And uh, I wanna share that my, my experience, you heard a little bit about it, serving in a legislative body, I think gives me a unique perspective. I, I have sat not exactly in your chair, as council members, but I have sat in an elected chair and I understand the pressures that that brings. I understand the need to deliver on behalf of people of your ward and people of the city. And I will honor that in this role as an appointed position. But I can't do it alone. And I do ask for your rededication. Most of you are returning and we'll have a, another council member soon to join you, though you're a pro already, <laughs> and being able to really, I think I can provide the ability to help coach and encourage our team in the Office of Public Service to understand positions, move and look at the interests, and move ideas and action forward. We're all here for the same reason, I believe, from talking to you. We are here for Minneapolis. We are here for residents of Minneapolis. There are challenges ahead, and I know that. We can work through them, ultimately. Um, I went back to someone that I have connected to all of my life, and that was Paul Wellstone. He was one of my mentors. And I think his words sum it up better than any I could right for you today. Politics is about the improvement of people's lives. It's about advancing the cause of peace and justice in our country and around the world. And politics is about doing well for people. That's my commitment. We're gonna do well for people together. Let's work together. Let's work together on behalf of the people and the lives that we can help build here in Minneapolis. I'd be honored to have your support moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to formally close the public hearing and ask if my colleagues have any comments or questions for Director Keller. I'm not seeing any. Um, I'll, sorry, should I be seeing any? <laughs> here. Council President. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and um, thanks to all the speakers that um, spoke on behalf of um, the nomination of uh, Ms. Anderson Kelleher 
And, you know, I have been working with um, Margaret, as she has been referred to today, um, for many, many years and has always appreciated her um, willingness to listen, um, her strategic thought process when, when the mayor nominated her for um, the director of public works. I was really uh, thrilled to support that nomination because I thought it would bring stability to our um, leadership team here at the city. And, and I believe that um, this nomination for COO will further um, elevate that um, stability to the city and, and to our leadership team. And so thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this nomination. And thank you, um, Ms. Anderson Kelleher, for being willing to um, accept this role if um, approved today. Thank you. Council Member Koski. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice President. Um, so I don't have a question, not yet. <laughs> but you know, here's the truth, that I have been secretly interviewing Margaret Anderson Kelleher since the very first day that she got here. And um, so I'm very grateful to see this nomination today. And I have uh, had the honor to be the vice chair and then the chair of Public Works, so have been able to work in this my first term, uh, be mentored, uh, supported, uh, and uh, had strong collaborations with her as the director of Public Works. And so here are a few things that I learned in our work together. She strives for, par for partnership and collaboration. She's a strong communicator. I heard this already, she listens. And she finds shared understanding. And because of these, and we've heard dozens of other accolades here today, I, um, I am proud to support you for this role as our next uh, city CEO. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ringville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will be voting for this. Uh, so thank you so much for your willingness to serve, Margaret. Thank you for your willingness to listen to all sides of, of a story. Uh, Thank you for your willingness to communicate. You, you go above and beyond, and uh, we heard that example of the, of the snow emergency, the terrible conditions we had, uh, but you responded to that. And I was especially uh, proud to hear the chief, the fire chief, talk about your willingness to listen to the firemen and, and uh, adjust the road, the road parking. Thank you for your willingness to protect the city's interests when dealing with other forms of government. We are not an island here in the city of Minneapolis. It's heartening to see the state officials here, but you get along with the county officials, you get along with the federal officials, and that's, that's so important. And most of all, I wanna thank you for your positive attitude. You walked down the hallway with a smile on your face. Even when you said no to me, you smile at me. <laughs> and you do say no quite a bit, maybe more than you should, but I'm throwing that out the window right now. And I look forward to voting for you for this nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chugtai. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Anderson Kelleher, I have a series of questions for you, so if you'll come on up. Um, I will start with, uh, you know, it's, it isn't a, a secret that we have a, a culture problem here at the city of Minneapolis. Um, and that culture problem includes um, our employees bringing to our attention um, issues with racism and sexism in the workplace. I know that's something that we would like to see change. I know that's something you're committed to. So can you help me understand um, in this role what you, what you hope to do to address um, racism and sexism in the workplace? Thank you, Madam Chair and Councilmember Chagtai. Um, first of all, thank you for all the conversations about this and the many other things we've had. Um, culture change is hard in any place, and particularly, I think it's even compounded here by our change in government structure that voters voted for and we are supporting. 
And so I think that has brought out in life, and there's other factors as well, that we have a real opportunity to both work with our department heads and deputies through programs like Metamorphosis, which I do think is valuable. I also know that the way we have culture change is to really embed this work throughout the organization. And so that's where the important work of Prince Corbett and as director of REIB is so critical to me, not just me personally, but me professionally, as well as other employees who really look forward to working together with REIB to create that curriculum that all employees can take in, to wrestle with, and hopefully we really can root out racism, sexism, gender discrimination, we must. We have to be reflective of our city, and that's our imperative. And so to do that, we have to invest in not only the contract work that we're doing and the programs, but really develop that work inside our organization, REIB, HR, and the others who will be involved. Thank you. Um, you 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 referenced the the new government structure, and I think that leads very well into my next question. Um, you know, we're all navigating what this new government structure looks like and what it means for for us as policymakers and as decision makers working together um, to improve outcomes for for the residents that we collectively serve. Um, a part of that equation is um, is how we as as policymakers um, communicate with the administration and and how we work together to to solve um, to solve really big and complex problems. Can you talk to me a little bit about your vision for what communicating and working with the council in this new role looks like? Madam Chair, Councilmember Chug Tai, and I believe almost every single person who I've spoken to on the council has talked about this very issue of, and that that is what I mean by, I think we need a reset in how we are sharing information back and forth, how we are working on shared problems together, especially the hardest problems. There is absolutely no doubt we need everyone and your all of your ability to be in regular dialogue with your constituents is an important, important piece of solving those problems because we can't get there without that voice in the room, whether it's a smaller issue or one of our much larger issues, being able to bring that forward. Um, I also think, you know, the mayor and I've had conversations about this. I, I can't be true to myself if I'm not working with all of you as well as the mayor, his executive team, as well as the Office of Community Safety and the city attorney's office. These offices working together in a really productive way, I can't be true to myself if I'm not doing that. And so regular meetings are going to be part and parcel of this, but it's gotta be more than that. It's also got to be that shared problem solving and how do we create the space to be able to do that across the legislative and executive. And I, I think we can do that. I believe we can do that. Thank you. And, and you know, I think, I think disagreement is inherent to good policymaking. Um, having wrestling through difficult things is how we get to the best possible outcome. Um, and and I, I think, um, I think, in, in this new role, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about what you, how you see yourself navigating disagreement between um, between the legislative and executive branches, and and in scenarios when um, when temperatures are high, what what do you see as your role in in helping us move through that and get to um, get to a, a productive solution? Madam Chair, Council Member Chug Tai, Council Members. Um, first, it starts with me. And I will say I can sometimes be fiery too. So keeping 
my own self-control and temperature. Um, in graduate school, I learned this terrific, and you're going to think you learned that in graduate school, what? But it, it, was, a, it was actually a course taught at, at the law school, in the school I went to, about emotions and emotions in negotiation. And, you know, for a long time, negotiations were taught as if they were devoid of emotion, right? It was all clinical. That's just, that doesn't work. We're human. We have emotion. And so learning how to understand myself in that moment, I think will help me help others understand themselves in that moment and be able to um, you're right. Conflict is inherent to this. You wouldn't exist if there weren't conflicts between people or businesses or neighbors. And so we just have to find a better way to get through that conflict, whether it's a small one or a big one. And um, also have the grace to say I'm sorry when we screw it up, which I believe I've said to most of you. And I know I've said to our residents from time to time, we also have to have the humility to know that we don't have all the answers ourselves, and we're stronger together. And that's what I think the beauty of this structure can be, is that we have really talented, talented public servants who want to contribute. They want to have interaction with all of you as well. And so I think that that's where it starts. But it's, it starts very personally for me. Um, I grew up in a scrappy household my four older brothers, I, I have a sister as well, but my four older brothers are 14 to 20 years older than me. I grew up on a dairy farm. And whether, I'm most certain I didn't learn good uh, conflict resolution skills back then. I did learn how to stand up for myself, because I had to. And I've all my life been trying to blend those two things together, that feisty, fiery side with the ability to listen and take it all in. Because when you're in that situation, you're a little sponge. And I want to make sure that going forward, we can have good working relationships based on that philosophy of people are going to be passionate about the things they know about, but we also have to be respectful of all of you. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I have for you, Director. My final question is for, for Mayor Fry, if you will. Um, this is, it, I, Director Anderson Kelleher is exceptionally qualified um, and, and no one can question her credentials. Um, so this is not about her particularly. This is about, um, my question is around the, the national search process that we went through. I know national searches are an incredibly expensive um, avenue to explore as well. And, um, and I know that there are a couple of council members here who served on, on, the, um, on the interview team um, as we completed the national search process for uh, the, the next COO. Um, I'm just wondering if you can speak to, uh, you know, your thinking and reasoning behind um, nominating someone who, who did not go through that process that, that was important to you and to all of us as well. Uh, uh, Madam uh, v Vice Chair, uh, Council Member Shugtai, yes, I'll uh, uh, consent to the question, and I appreciate it, and it's a fair one. Uh, we have been through a number of national searches for the role of either coordinator and or chief operating officer over the last several years. It's a tough job. Uh, and uh, so we went through a process. Uh, at the end of that process, uh, I uh, was in, intent on choosing Heather Johnston. Uh, Heather is a, an incredible uh, public servant herself, and I, again, want to thank her for all of her work. Uh, Heather decided uh, that she wanted to take her life trajectory elsewhere, uh, a decision that I deeply respect, and it's a decision that is hers to make. Uh, given that we have been through a number of national searches, uh, and given that we have someone of Margaret Anderson Kelleher's caliber right in front of us that has been doing the work that is really adept at forging these deep partnerships, I felt that she was the right person at the right time. And so rather than go through another national search when I was confident that uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher was the right person, I chose her and put her name forward. 
Wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Council Member Osman. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Council Vice President. Um, it's great to hear from uh, many leaders in, in this room to say great things about uh, Director Margaret Kalahar. Um, that says a lot for your commitment, a long commitment to public service and really appreciate your voices. Um, I have voted for you 2022 on February on your nomination, but you and me had a conversation. Uh, my experience with public works under your leadership has not been great. Regarding Carmel Mall parking uh, and loading zones, uh, one-sided parking on the snow emergency we had on our most density community neighborhood in Minneapolis. Feel like many things were not considered and that's what I continue to advocate regarding that um, cultural aspect of it and thinking about how important it is for some communities that they are, they should be looked at not the same brush as every um, community in Minneapolis. I represent a very unique community that regards um, different cultural way of looking at it. One of the things we talked about, you and me and I, have continued to advocate is that Carmel Mall, when I brought my opinion and what the community think and the community that have came here, had a conversation with the mayor's office, wrote a lot of petitions saying that the meter parking that Public Works continue to enforce and not listen to the community is not working for them. As a council member where I came to you, I felt like I was not listened to. It, felt like I was told that is how things work. And I was really disappointed from that. You have to know that the community I represent, I'm their only voice. They're not privileged to advocate themselves. They're not privileged to speak the language to understand how operations work and city of Minneapolis work. We, I came, my point is that same brush of city services and how we do things might not work for some communities. And I think elected official who represents them has a voice and has should be considered when issues come up. In my experience, as we talked about, government structure has not been great. <laughs> I feel like sometimes I don't have the answers for my residents. I am their elected official, but regarding encampments, um, issues in my word, you know that, and everyone know that. We make the ordinance, but we cannot act on it. It's up to the mayor. So for me, in this office, operation officer is very important for my office and for my resident to say we want someone in this leadership to work with us and to hear our side and what we're saying. I know sometimes politics get into things, but basic services in our city shouldn't. I like to say that if you are, are approved and move forward, I would love to work with you. I want you to succeed in your position. 
But I really want you to know that City of Minneapolis is a very diverse community. And what works for uptown and downtown might not work in Ward 6, might not work in um, Carmel Mall and others. All I'm asking is that we want to do something good for our community as elected officials, and we want the city leaders to listen to us to improve the lives of our residents. I just want to make that comment. Um, thank you, Council Vice President. Councilmember Charity. Thank you, Director Anderson Kelleher, for your words. I did want to call you up to ask a question, if that's all right. Um, and I think it is related to some of the things that uh, Councilmember Osman touched on and some of the things that you and I discussed, and I really appreciated the time that you've taken to speak with me along with members on this body. I think it serves us all to have this form of collaboration in deliberating on your nomination. It means a lot. And you mentioned it in your remarks, um, an overhaul in a community engagement. Um, I think residents across our city, residents in Ward 12, residents in Ward 9, South Side, North Side, across the board, um, have felt that the city could engage with them better or empower them more in conversations. And I think a struggle point that I have seen with government structure change is that um, in figuring out our lanes, council members need to figure out how they can represent the vision of their community and bring it forward. Um, for me, it feels really incumbent on me that I'm coming in being sent by uh, 34,000 residents in Ward 12, and I've heard their stories, I've heard their concerns in the same way other council members have, and a big part of my job is to be able to bring their vision to this table and have it show up in what we deliver at City Hall, and I just would love to hear you speak on what your vision for that is and what your vision for overhauling community engagement looks like. Chair Palmasano. Councilmember Chowdhury, thank you for the conversations that we've had already and all council members on the issue of community engagement. I believe this is one of the areas that we have to really look seriously at where we've been, our failures in community engagement, and our some successes in community engagement, but we need more consistent community engagement that's going to give the real, I think, the results that people want to see, which is to be heard first and foremost, to take in good ideas when they come forward, and I believe being able to really create some sort of community engagement playbook that can be used by every single department in this enterprise with their specific ingredients put into it because frankly, right now, um, we do a lot of different things in terms of community engagement in the city. And some of it has really missed the mark. Other pieces of it, people do feel heard. And I think that that is one of those first 18 month pieces of work that is top of my mind. I, I believe I heard it from almost everyone that community engagement needs to be improved in the city and I am committed to that. We will have a new deputy here soon, who she comes from a, a place of having a lot of experience, both in um, high profile stressful situations, as well as working with very different communities across the place she's coming from. I'm excited for that to work with her and I think this is a place that we can have success to reform our own community engagement process. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I, I just, one follow up on that if that's all right. Um, for me, I, I understand that uh, from Ward 12 residents themselves, they come from a very privileged part of the city and I wanna be in strong allyship to 
wards that have a concentration of black, brown, immigrant, working residents. And I think the places where we have fallen the most short in community engagement are the places where black, brown, immigrant, indigenous residents um, needed that empowerment to be a part of the community process. Uh, I'd love to hear you speak to how specifically you would support the engagement of those communities in our city so we can move away from continuing uh, the legacy of disparities and disenfranchisement that we've had there. Madam Chair and Council Members, I really think this is, um, there's kind of twofold. One is strengthening our relationships within the community as a city enterprise to the leaders of community, but then the second part is using different methods as well to get directly to people. And I think that um, what we do know about good community engagement is it has to speak to people where they are at and it has to come to them. Um, community, members of the community often have a lot of barriers to coming to a council meeting like this or coming to some formal committee meeting. And so taking out our community engagement into the community in multiple ways whether it's trying to get more young people's voices heard in our process, or if it's particular communities, communities of color who have historically been disenfranchised, we need to find ways to empower community to have their voice heard. And so I don't have every answer right now about what does it look like. I just know that there are better models than what we have been doing. And we're gonna all have to go through a process of dissecting what we've done, honoring and owning what we've done in the past, and building something new together, for sure. Thank you. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I don't have any questions. I'm just going to make a few comments. Um, <clears throat> You know, I uh, wanted to echo um, a lot of the sentiment of my colleagues. Um, I believe Councilmember uh, Chick Tai uh, mentioned that you were the most qualified person that, that, that we could hope to have in this role. And so I want to thank the mayor for your nomination. And I want to thank you for your conversation. And um, I will be supporting you today. And um, I know that there have been a lot of conversations. I know you've had a lot of conversations with colleagues. You and I were able to have a conversation. And I think that we're in this moment, especially with regards to government structure, and we all get, you know, in, in some sense, we're all kind of new council. We all only have two years under our belt because under government structure, we're all sort of relearning uh, the institution. And, um, and I appreciate the ways in which you've shown up and been willing to have hard conversations. Um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to figure out how we're working together as an enterprise and as as a city and as a body. Um, that being said, you know we're 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 sort of still in the growing pains of that, right? We're going to face disagreements. We're going to, um, you know, I've I know that there are folks on this dais who've got legitimate reasons for why they might not support you, and there are folks on this dais who have legitimate reasons for why they do support you. I'm, you know, I count myself among them. And so in that, you know, I just want to continue to urge you, I want to continue to urge the mayor that as we face and wade through disagreement, that we continue this tone of working well with one another, of not taking out, uh, you know, vendettas against one another. I'm not speaking to you directly, Margaret. I hope you understand what I'm getting at. But um, um, if I didn't think you were capable of sort of holding yourself to that higher that higher ethic, that higher standard, um, then I'd probably be facing a different sort of set of set of, set of decisions here. It's because I it's because of not only your long resume, but also because of the ways in which I see you show up as as a uh, as a unifier, um, not somebody who's going to do everything that Councilmember Rainville asked you to do. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> but, um, but, um, <laughs> but um but as somebody who is uh you know uh who who is uh going to make sure uh that you that you do listen i think you've heard on this dais that there are council members that that feel the opposite they've had that opposite experience uh, but i trust you to uh to, to mediate that to to rectify that and to uh build bridges on this dais and uh, uh along this third floor here so um so thank you for your service uh that you've given um 
you know, over, your, over the course of your whole life, of course, uh, that doesn't even begin to, 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 add, to adequately state it. But thank you for that service and thank you for your service to the city. Um, and we'll continue to push each other and disagree with one another and debate and argue and, and, and hopefully uh, uh, come to consensus uh, at those really critical moments. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. Council Member Chavez. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Thank you, Director Anderson Kelleher. I do have one question. Um, but before I begin, I did want to say that part of this role is going to be critical in addressing the culture within the city enterprise, one that many of our city employees have pointed out that can be racist and toxic, something that your position is going to have to tackle head on. I know you answered this previously, so I'm not going to ask you directly that question, but knowing the history within this office, part of that is going to be addressing a racist and toxic culture that many of our city employees have pointed out. Now, part of the role of the Office of Public Service is overseeing the health department, something that is really important to many of our residents in the green zones. I do want to hear your vision for the green zones, particularly in East Phillips, in addressing pollution in our neighborhoods. Madam Chair, Council Member Chavez, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I was thinking back when we were talking just yesterday about the South Side Green Zone. And I'm pretty sure I was there when both South Side and, green, and North Side Green Zone were created through legislation. And there was a reason it was created. Both were created. And that is because the two communities represent communities that historically have been disempowered, don't have the necessarily always the means to be involved and also had legacy industrial uses that I think we now see as incompatible with a vibrant green city. And so knowing that history and having heard, uh, you know, former Representative Karen Clark talk about that passion. We talked about this yesterday. My nephew lived in the arsenic triangle. His lawn was removed, just like so many others. And so knowing that history, we must work very hard to see those industrial uses, not that they don't have a home somewhere in the state of Minnesota, because some of them do do important work. I just don't think those uses are necessarily compatible with our vision of the green zones. And so working very hard with you, working very hard with your colleagues, working with the state legislature, working hopefully with the governor's administration to figure out that way that we go forward where um, really those micro pollutants are not going to continue to harm people as well as macro pollutants. Thank you. Are you through, Council Member? Uh, Council Member Payne. Thank you, Vice President Palmisano. Um, I've been trying to approach this appointment from a number of different lenses. Um, maybe kind of like some concentric search girls, right? Like system, what's the process? What's the role? And then ultimately, who's the person that's going to be filling that role? And then you can even go in even another layer of the professional and the personal, right? And we share some pretty intense shared personal experiences. Um, and I feel a deep connection with you for that alone, honestly. Um, but I want to step back in my role as a council member and recognize that I'm a part of a system and I have a role within the system. And that role I take very seriously. And I, I put that above other things sometimes even to a detriment, perhaps. Um, and as I think about this role, I can't separate out the personal sometimes because you, know, you, you will be the fifth uh, coordinator now slash COO since I've joined City Hall in 2016 as a contractor. And part of my personal journey towards filling that role is one that I think is a shared personal 
story for you, being the first or sometimes the only or sometimes the first and only in a lot of your professional spaces. And, you know, I moved here from Milwaukee to go to the University of Minnesota. Um, I did an engineering degree. I would be the only black person in my classes, right? Um, I went to grad school. I would be the only black person in my classes. My first job out of college, I was the only black person that worked in the factory. Um, and in fact, that was the truth of my professional career until I arrived at the city. And it was the very first time that I ever had a black manager and predominantly black coworkers. And it was actually a really meaningful life experience for me. And so, you know, I'm in this kind of system role, but my personal, personal path towards getting here was because of the reality of being a black man working in City Hall and there being some very real racist experiences. And in fact, the reason I'm a council member is because I was a contractor and when we were trying to navigate as a team these racist experiences, there is these determinations of should we be reporting to HR? Should we be filing lawsuits? And I just didn't think I had a claim one way or another other than I guess I'll just run for council. So that's the personal journey that's brought me to this decision that we're making today. Um, but I'm trying to step back from that like really intense personal experience and really think about this, about what is the role? What is the system that this role is operating within? And one of the really critically important functions is around culture so that other people don't have these types of personal experiences like I had. And I, I have to be completely transparent that I was struggling with this because I sat on the COO panel. I got to meet all of those national candidates. Um, you weren't included in that, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, I'm arriving at this decision by way of an election outcome with what feels like a forced and rushed um, nomination outside of what we had was a formal process that was bringing credibility to it. And we talked about this when we first met one on one. And I've been really kind of waxing and waning with my decision. I think um, Councilmember Chugtai did a really great job of just like, at the personal professional level, like th there's like, you can't go to a lab and come up with somebody who's more experienced and more prepared for this role, right? Um, and at the same time, you are arriving at this nom nomination th with a context with a context that's really challenging on a personal level for me to navigate. And so, you know, I had a conversation with the mayor last night, he called me, and my honest answer with him was, I don't know. I'm not a yes, but I'm not a no. I just need to have more conversations. We were able to have a really frank conversation over lunch today, and I said I wanted to have a follow-up conversation with the mayor before I could arrive where I needed to arrive. And we haven't had the time to do that. Um, and so I want to propose um, forwarding this uh, without recommendation so that we can make time and space for those conversations. And so I'm making a formal motion to forward without recommendation so that we can have those follow-ups. Second. All right, that motion has been forwarded and seconded. Councilmember Payne, did you have other Words, are you done with your remarks? Um, I think that uh, it, this is actually one of those really hard, challenging things, right? Because we, and I'm also, I also shared that I was concerned that we wouldn't have a public works leader as well, and you brought a lot of stability to that. And I'm looking at some deputies over there who are imagining the days when they were dual interims and probably thinking about what that's like going forward. And those were some of the other things that I had on my mind as well, but um, I think come Thursday, we can have some of the conversations necessary, and I'll be following up with you, Mayor, for that conversation. All right, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I want to start by saying thank you, Director Anderson Kelleher, for not applying for a job along with your boss. That actually speaks volumes to me that you are definitely capable of this position, but it speaks to your uh, collaboration efforts and whom I know you to be. So I originally met you in 2007 when I was advocating for freedom to breathe. And I believe you were speaker at that time. And I was at the Capitol and it was super crowded. There was a lot of like stuff going back and forth with freedom to breathe. And you were just masterful. I, I can remember, and I tell you all the time, in 07, when I just started doing a lot of advocacy work, I really looked up to you because you knew how to garner bipartisan support like none other. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was a big deal to have votes on the other side and to have support from a Republican governor and all of these things that none of us as advocates had accounted for when it came to the Minnesota Clean Indoor Air Act. One of the big things was we were told that we were going to uh, in the hospitality industry as we knew it. That if we stopped, uh, Senator Dibble is shaking his head because he was there too. We were told, you know, I was told personally, this is the beginning and the end of your career, Ms. Vital. You want this to be the big thing. And I remember you just really giving the entire group the confidence in saying, I feel good about this. I think you all should really keep pushing. Will you have to make some adjustments to some things? You will, but you should keep doing it. And so you were you were really a big light for me because I had I had never seen a woman in the position that you were in. And I had never seen a woman push back in a way like you had done in politics in that moment at that time. And so I've shared that story with you many times. I'm forever grateful for you. And then later on, I found out that we both loved Airedale Terriers and that just made it even better for the both of us. And so our love of dogs, our loves of our love of clean air, you know, all the work that you did for the environment has always uh, meant a lot to me because I've always represented an underserved community that was most impacted by a lot of the work that you and others have done. So I appreciate what you've done. I was happy to vote for you two years ago. I've told you lots of times also when, I, when the mayor nominated you, I thought Margaret will bring a level of humanity to public works <clears throat> that I don't feel connected to, you know, something <clears throat> different. Because public works is tough and it can feel like <clears throat> You know, you're just like screaming at a brick wall. I show, I, I share some of Councilmember Osman's frustrations. And I will also say, I've had my best fights with Margaret and my worst fights with <coughs> Margaret. And it sounds like a lot of my colleagues have too. And Councilmember Rainville says, you should say no less. And you and I have argued about you saying no less to me. And I think you heard me. We had a great meeting just this week where we talked through some specific things about the North Side. The North Side is where I represent, who I love, and I always feel like as the Ward 4 Council member, my war gets lost in Ward 5. People think of West Broadway when they think of the North Side, but that's a very small part. Uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Ellison. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, it's hard for me. It's a challenge. That's a very small part of the North Side, but that's what people think of, right? And that's not War for. And so we've had conversations you know, about how you're gonna address the issues of War 4, which are very different issues than War 5 at times. And you've also, you know, I've called you in, in the middle of the night and talked about a pothole and you've drove over to uh, look at the actual pothole and, you know, to work on it. You, when we had that water line break, that was crucial. That was a big deal in this city, and we needed you to manage all those complexities. We needed you to be the face of what was happening in this community, and to, you did a solid job at communicating with residents, with council members about what was happening. Um, 
People were afraid of what was happening. There was a lot of rumors going around about water. The Flint water crisis came up so many times, and you did a great job at managing uh, questions, concerns, even dropped off water to residents' homes who were out of water over time. So thank you uh, so much for all of that. I mean, I really... I'm really looking forward to the work that we can do together. I didn't know that we would be in this place. I, you know, I, I want to also thank um, interim COO Johnston for the work that she's put in over these couple of years. She's another one that walks the streets of the North Side when I ask to see what's going on um, when I ask for something. And so I'm looking forward to working with you in that way. More trips with us and the dogs. You, you didn't get an Airedale this time, but I, I accept that you got a different terrier breed. So I'm, I'm looking forward to us walking on the north side, really looking at some of the upcoming projects like Upper Harbor Terminal and um, you know, a lot of the challenges I have in the ward that I've spoke with you about. And so I am definitely going to be supporting you and I appreciate you stepping up at this time in this city to help. Thank you. Thank you. We have four more of my colleagues in queue and I just want to remind everybody that we, um, we have a very um, considered and long agenda after this. So if you need to take a turn to take care of yourself here, please do so. Um, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, several of my colleagues have already brought the fact about the, the public hearing where I know I also had asked uh, Mayor Fry if he would commit to a national search. Um, and as Council Member Payne highlighted from my understanding that search had got kicked off early uh, this summer, um, yet council received no updates around what happened with that process. It does seem like from what I'm hearing on the day is right now that it had attracted some strong candidates. But again, council never received any updates on uh, how we got to this place where we are being asked to consider um, and approve an internal hire. And nevertheless, you know, Director Anderson Keller, I would like to say since your appointment, early last year, um, I have enjoyed working with you. Um, you have been fairly responsive to concerns that I've raised, um, especially regards around constituent concerns. Um, you were very responsive when the chicanes were needed um, and uh, Longfellow around Brackett Park. So it's, it's been a very fruitful relationship um, in working with you and the rest of the public work staff. Um, that being said, and some of my colleagues have also talked about this, um, I think it's important to center the fact that this role will be one of the most powerful positions in City Hall um, and has as well as will possess a great deal of power to help our city accomplish substantial transformations in the areas of racial equity, climate resiliency, public safety, beyond policing, and good governance. Um, and our city, I think all my colleagues can agree that our city is in desperate and dire need of leadership that will rise to the occasion, especially since we're experiencing record low levels of confidence and, and credibility amongst the public. Um, so with that in mind, I want to raise three examples that do make me a bit concerned about your ability to accomplish those uh, things. Um, I want to start off with the appointment process of interim COO Heather Johnson. Um, last year during a public hearing for uh, Johnson, um, as some of my council colleagues raised, um, this body and the public during a public hearing, her from over 60 um, existing and former city employees about um, their experience in having to work in a toxic racist culture under um, her particular leadership at that time in the city coordinator's office. Um, those staff members took a huge risk with going public about their experiences. And I don't think anyone can question the courage it took for them to come forward and speak out. Um, while I was jarred, you know, by their testimony, I was not completely shocked because I think many of us are aware about the racial disparities that exist outside of City Hall, absolutely exist within it as well. But what did surprise me is, you know, 
was despite workers in departments from throughout the city standing together and asking for, as you even highlighted, um, a better anti-racist leadership, several department heads, including yourself, submitted a letter to council basically asking us to set aside that testimony and appoint Heather Johnson anyways. And it was difficult for me to see you and other department heads who also witnessed the same testimony that we did and see our staff have to recount the trauma that they experienced here and simply request that we ignore that. And to me, the willingness in that moment to ignore or, or just not uplift um, those impacted by systemic racism, that does feel like a disqualifier for me for the chief operating officer position. Um, it makes me concerned, again, about how you will rise to meet this moment where you know, people are looking to us to be unflinching in our honesty and deliver on systemic change, especially around racism. And in the last decade, Minneapolis, we were a leader at the nationwide level, at the state level around workers' rights, tenant protections, investments in transit infrastructure. I'm pretty sure you're aware of that. But in the last few years, the city is no longer seen as a leader or a trailblazer in innovative and progressive policy. Um, and this has been demonstrated by talented, great staff leaving the city in mass and the struggle to implement and enforce existing policies that our communities have asked us uh, to bring forward. But with that said, I do wanna switch gears to Hennepin Ave as well. Um, your decisions regarding 24 seven bus lanes or Hennepin Ave mean for my residents that transit users feel like they will not be prioritized um, in favor of car-centric infrastructure <coughs> on diverse and cultural cor corridors. Um, prior to my time in City Hall, I know many of my constituents participated in helping shape the transporta Transportation Action Plan, TAP. Um, and they really worked to make sure public transportation was included in that. And you know, with how you navigate it, Hennepin Ave, my, many of my constituents are concerned, are we gonna remain committed to our goals of expanding and funding tr public transportation, especially in our street redesigns and reconstruction projects? The last example that I also wanna name is the East Phillip Urban Farm. I just wanna point out, blank, like point blankly, like Director Anderson Kelleher, you were on the wrong side of that issue. <coughs> and you know, that was a moment where we could have demonstrated as a city under your leadership that we are committed to racial equity, that we are committed to the green zones, that we are honoring the commitment that we made when we declare racism as a public health emergency. Um, and many of our residents organized for 10 years to ask the city to get behind their vision of a process <clears throat> where we can do that reparative environmental um, justice. And you didn't show up in that moment for those residents too. And seeing the ways in which you haven't been responsive to the moments where we could have advanced racial, environmental, and transit equity, um, both within and outside of City Hall, makes me concerned about how you're going to show up for other upcoming sensitive projects like the Community Safety Center, the Third Precinct, and 3,000 mini ha ha redevelopment efforts. Um, in the next year, we're going to be taking on a lot more other projects from supporting renter protection, supporting unhoused residents with strategies outside of evictions. And the role of the COO impacts residents too much for me to vote confidently yesterday. Um, but outside of that, I look forward to working with you regardless of the outcome, um, because our residents' needs is the most thing that is important in this work. Um, so I look forward to doing like what we've been doing for the past two years and figuring out how we can create deliverables for working class people in our city. Thank you. Council Member Charity. Director Anderson Kelleher, I again wanna just thank you for taking the time and accepting the nomination. Um, I see a lot of your story and my own, being a staffer turned elected, and being a public servant at heart and how you really, I think, do your best to serve the people of Minneapolis first. Um, I want to thank my colleagues here on the dais um, and Council Member Wansley for laying out a lot of that context that we're talking about <coughs> in this uh, nomination of this position and how much weight that we all understand this position has. 
Um, we are in a moment where we are a part of proving if we can build a trustable and functional government, local government, and our residents are waiting for us to prove that. And that's, this is one of the big first steps that we're doing going into next year is determining if we can prove that. And I appreciated your acknowledgement of failure. Uh, I think that is really important to talk about the ways in which the city has failed, where individuals in the enterprise have failed or we've collectively failed in order to learn from mistakes and not repeat them. Um, so I appreciate that. And I am looking forward to the opportunity of us figuring out how we can build a really strong partnership uh, between this position and this council with the administration, with the mayor. Um, this is truly the mandate before us. And the mandate that I was sent in here and dropped in early into this council to be a part of. Um, it is not lost on me that this is the first nomination that I'm voting on, and I've wanted to be very thoughtful and intentional about uh, the vote that I will take, and I acknowledge and know that I am one member of this body, and I understand that there are many colleagues on this body that would like to take some time to really consider what we have heard from community members who have spoken, our partners in other levels of government, and our own staff, and your remarks, um, and this great discussion that we've had today, and it's really important to me that um, we take this step together, and that's why I seconded uh, Council Member Payne's motion to move forward without recommendation. Um, I think this allows us to do the really good work of starting to build that trust, starting to bring, build that function, and starting to build that partnership. So I just wanted to state that. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I wanted to uh, uh, speak really quickly on why I, I, I want us to move together as a council. Not that we're going to be a unanimous vote no matter what, but I do want us to move together as a council. We've got a process here that has been at least a little bit fast forwarded, and I think that, and, we've, and we are just coming out of uh, a really grueling uh, budget season. We've got council members who are sworn in ahead of schedule, and we've got council members who are not sure, who are asking for two more days to have follow-up conversations. I think, it's, I think it's a reasonable request. Obviously, people know where I stand on this issue. Um, you know, when we, when we vote, whether it's today or on Thursday, uh, I'll be voting in favor to, uh, uh, to confirm you, uh, and I think that that's where a lot of folks are, but I wanted to speak to uh, why I felt like if my colleagues feel that they need a few days, I'm asking the rest of my colleagues to honor that request um, as opposed for us to take a very disjointed vote and then we're, 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 we're trying to recollect until Thursday. Um, you still have my support. I think you have, a, I think I, I'm not necessarily counting the votes up here, but I think you have a, a majority of this body's support. I think it's reasonable for uh, a handful of our colleagues to have a few more days to have their follow-up meetings um, and for us to take this up uh, definitively on Thursday. So I just wanted to speak in favor of that motion, uh, despite the fact that I, you know, I myself am prepared to, to, to vote today. Councilmember Chugta. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also wanted to just quickly speak to the motion to forward this, um, forward this nomination to Thursday's council meeting for final action without a recommendation today. Um, I, I have, um, I have had a number of conversations with the director along with um, a few colleagues here and have feel I, I feel really um, really good about the path forward I feel really good about um, the vote that that I'm gonna take on Thursday and I would just like some time to be able to follow up with with constituents who have had conversations with me since the nomination was made um, as councilmember Ellison noted this is our busiest time of year uh, we are you know we're gonna meet again in in a few hours and, and take up the final public hearing on our budget and at the end of the night approve our budget. Um, and and so, uh, you know, I'm just asking for that consideration just a couple of days worth of time and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, taking a final vote on this issue on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Osmond. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I just wanna take a time to really thank and appreciate interim CEO Heather Johnson who has been a great friend and great ally to me, uh, to my work, 
she has been exceptional for her work um, and my experience working with her. So we just, just want to let you know that we really appreciate your work you have done. Wish you could stay longer, but, you know, good luck to you and um, thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no further discussion, I'm going to ask uh, that we call the roll on the motion to move forward without recommendation, though I can see we have um, support to make a decision today. Let's try to bring everybody along um, and come together by Thursday. So clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Wansley. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Vita. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chugtai. Aye. Koski. Aye. Chowdhury. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmisano. Aye. There are 13 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. Thank you for everybody's time here in this room. We're going to move on to our next item, which is um, the after action review update. And I'll allow just a minute for people who want to transition in or out of the room to do so and call up Interim Director Gorman. Thank you. I think that's about the quietest transition I've ever seen. Um, item number three is an update on the progress of an improvement plan following the 2020 Civil Unrest After Action Report. Um, before us is Director Brian Gorman, Office of Emergency Management, to give a presentation on this item. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Council Members. I'm um, Brian Gorman, Interim Director of Emergency Management. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Deputy Chief Clampy and Director Bergstrom uh, to give you our Q3 and Q4 update on the uh, planning for the 2020 Civil Unrest uh, Action Action Report. Uh, the agenda for today follows what you've kind of seen here before. Um, I'll do a real brief overview of, of the project itself, um, and then we'll delve into the two main uh, components of it, uh, the NIMS Reset Project, which uh, emergency management is uh, coordinating and then we'll dig into the uh, department level projects that uh, DC Glampy and Director Bergstrom will report out on. Um, just a quick refresher where we've kind of been. Um, we started these, uh, this project back in March of 2022. Uh, we've done quarterly reports since then, um, this one being hopefully our second to last report. We'll hopefully do one more here uh, first quarter next year where we can report out on the completion of this project. Our overall approach, um, we've, we've taken um, some items here on enterprise level, um, our NIMS reset, which takes a look at our um, command and um, coordination system and uh, did retraining, re-exercising on those items uh, to build our capacity here to respond to instances. Um, and then the rest of the projects were divvied out um, at a department level that were specific uh, to their respective uh, uh, items. So we'll go into the NIMS Reset Project here first. Um, the NIMS Reset Project um, uh, takes on uh, 10 of these uh, findings from the report along with uh, six uh, recommendations. Um, our objectives here pretty much again to demonstrate a capability that we can use NIMS in the coordination and uh, command system uh, part of it. So we're just here to retrain everybody on the pieces and parts along with exercises so we can demonstrate that capability. Uh, updated timeline, everything seems to be regressing on this part of the project um, as we had planned. A uh, few things have moved here and there, but overall, again, we were planning to try to get this done by Q1 of next year, uh, which we are on, on pace to do. Um, Q2, uh, we finished up our training, which I believe um, Director Lane had reported out on um, and had moved us into kind of the next phase of the project, which is our exercises. So we had seven exercises planned out. Five of those we completed here in Q3 and up to this point in Q4. We have one more, our um, Incident Command EOC, Emergency Operations Center interface, which is scheduled for later this week. We'll complete that one. And then the last one we'll have here in the series is our multi-agency coordination group 
uh, which we would hope to get it in in November, but we needed to, a little extra time, so we will get that completed here uh, by mid-January of next year. All of that work um, is culminating here in our capstone exercise, which uh, we have scheduled for March of next year. Um, this will be a four-day exercise. FEMA has invited us out to uh, Emmitsburg, Maryland, to their Emergency Management Institute to uh, complete the course. It's a rigorous course full of, of activities and exercises that test participants on uh, their knowledge of NIMS and uh, the incident management system. So we are excited. I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to get out there and demonstrate what we've learned um, on a national stage. So next steps for this, um, kind of as I had highlighted, we have two more exercises here. We'll get completed here in the next 45 days or so. And then we'll continue our planning for our capstone exercise here for, for March of next year. Um, our scorecard, um, as we had um, highlighted here, the seven remaining um, recommendations that are left open, at least to, to this presentation today. Um, uh, DC Glampy will be next here and um, can report out on PD's progress in those. And then Director Birdstrom was here to do the last two for uh, the uh, OCS uh, communications plans. DC Glampy. Thank you. Welcome, Deputy Chief Glampy. Thank you so much. I'm Deputy Chief Travis Glampy with the Police Department, uh, overseeing the Constitutional Policing Bureau. Um, from our scorecard, you can see the list of things uh, with uh, community conversations being added to us at some point between uh, the last time this was reported out and now. Uh, one big piece we'd like to highlight is um, the NIMS ICS training. Uh, this was a huge task for the police department to get everybody trained in this. Um, we are nearly com completely trained. As a matter of fact, I eagerly signed up to go to one of these three-day classes before I forgot I had something important to be at this afternoon reporting out on this very topic. <laughs> so we're very proud of this to be able to have everybody nearly trained by Q1. Uh, that will be taken care of. The new piece I talked about is the community conversations. And as part of um, our community engagement um, this summer and fall, we did that where um, we allowed for that open dialogue with the communities. And I, I feel that this is something that, while hopefully we cross off and call it completed, that's not gonna end for us. Uh, as we continue to go forward with our community engagement, uh, this will always be a topic uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, number three, that constructive conversation uh, piece. This is really something we've put into practice for many years. We formalized it by talking to um, Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, about how they do it. But this is essentially the, the idea that if you have an issue like a protest or something coming up in the community, we try and reach out to the organizers and um, have those conversations ahead of time so that we all can work on the same page to the extent possible. So that's something, again, we're just going to formalize in writing and um, be able to cross off um, of the to-do list. Uh, the next piece is the workforce analysis and leadership training. Um, as you can imagine, anytime you're dealing with new leaders, it's always important to have that level of development. And so we've crossed many of these things off, but we're going to continue moving forward, including bringing the uh, FBI's leadership enforcement or law enforcement executive development um, classes, hopefully to Minneapolis later this year. Um, we're working with HR on a supervisor training curriculum, not to mention uh, kind of reviving one that we had in place for our new supervisors. And then one thing that we did very deliberately with Chief O'Hara is he asked all of us, who's going to take your place? And so not only did he do that with the reorganization that brought in his new leadership team, but we're constantly being asked um, to keep that in mind as we develop new leaders uh, for the future. <sighs> One piece here that's still left undone that we're wrapping up with, um, with public works is figuring out if we were to have this level of civil unrest again, how are we going to protect our uh, vital infrastructure? 
uh, buildings like City Hall, Waterworks, Police Precincts. Um, we are hopefully in the final phases of getting that on paper and finalized, so by Q1, that will be off our list. And then finally, a real big one, and I know, um, Chair Palmasano, I know this is a big thing for you with the employee wellness. You've worked with MPD on this. You know, on top of bringing in the mental health services and the wellness app, um, we are currently getting ready to open up that hiring for our health and wellness manager for the police department. It's going through the uh, job specs with HR, and we're hoping even by the end of the year we can get that thing posted and get a manager into that position because it is vitally important to have that one person directing all the health and wellness for the police department. I will turn it over to Director Bergstrom. Thank you. Welcome, Director Bergstrom. Thank you, um, Chair Palmasano, Council Members. Um, really happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Greta Bergstrom. I am the City's Communications Director, and I'm here to report on the progress and really the completion of the two recommendations um, from the After Action Report that um, were placed in the Communications Department's um, realm. Um, these are both related uh, to comprehensive public information plan that would guide um, uh, incidents, uh, complex incidents, um, crisis situations, and really matters of um, public <coughs> trust and public reputation. Um, up front, I would like to thank a few people. Um, I want to thank former um, Emergency Management Director Barrett Lane, who is no longer here with the city, but he has worked long and hard and has really supported um, and participated in um, the, the development of this crisis communications plan, including authoring the first section, the crisis management plan, um, which is really an underpinning to the, the broader plan itself. Um, I'd like to thank Interim uh, City Operations Officer Heather Johnston for her support, her involvement, and her review um, and uh, edits um, to the document and to the plan. I'd like to thank um, broadly NCR leadership and staff who continue to help support um, and provide guidance um, for the work um, and who also provide leadership within the JIC in the community relations section um, in charge really of language um, access, translations, interpretations, um, which is really um, critical to the uh, communication of information to our community members. Um, and I would really like to thank um, the city's social media officer and digital communications coordinator, Jordan Gilgenbeck, who is in my department um, for countless hours of research, um, development, and aggregation of data. Um, Jordan has really gone above and beyond um, in helping me, in helping our department, and helping the city um, uh, really put this plan together. It has been a team effort. It will continue to need to be a team effort um, through trainings, through active use of the plan as we move forward, um, and for all facets of the city, from the council to the mayor's office to the Office of Community Safety, Office of Public Service, uh, to utilize this plan. Um, the first recommendation, uh, recommendation 13, is a crisis communications plan. So the city should develop a citywide plan uh, and response guide with instructions on responding to various scenarios. Um, the first is we've spent over 500 hours in trainings, um, NIMS compliant trainings. These are uh, complete, uh, ICS 100 through 800. Um, and that includes not only communication staff within the communications department, but communication staff in, embedded in other departments around, um, around the city. Um, the JIC or just a functional exercise was completed uh, at the end of October. Um, there are upcoming trainings, um, including the emergency management course um, at Emmitsburg in March that we'll be participating in as well to make sure that this works and actually um, uh, we are ready um, should the need arise. And then, um, of course, the broader plan here, it is robust. It is over 100 pages. It is um, developed to be accessible. It is developed to be usable. It is developed so different. Uh, there's nine sections. They can be pulled out separately. Um, there are, you know, it is a usable. We don't want it to live on a shelf. We want people to actually uh, use the plan and be able to use it if they just drop in and, and uh, 
uh, you know, have the ability to pick up and go. Um, the overall objectives of the plan are to provide roles and guidelines when responding to a crisis to ensure the city is the first and the best source of timely, accurate information, to build public trust and confidence. We want to make sure that the, the public is confident in our release of public information, that we are transparent in doing that. Um, we want consistent communications, um, singular messages that everybody in the enterprise um, can amplify, and to establish clear communications protocols um, with our stakeholder um, partners. There are nine sections of this plan. Uh, the first section is crisis management, and again, uh, former Director Lane authored that uh, through emergency management. Um, crisis communications and public information, um, there is a section number three on critical incidents. Um, this section um, does need some additional work. Um, we have some new partners, um, the new Commissioner Barnett in the Office of Community Safety, um, and uh, they will be providing some additional updates. I will also say that that section would um, speak specifically um, to critical incidents as outlined in um, the city settlement agreement with Minnesota Department of Human Rights. So that's kind of its own standalone section to be in compliance. Um, there are response guides, uh, strategies. Um, we've got checklists, worksheets that can be used. Again, it's a usable uh, living document that will be updated as well. Um, and there is um, a color-coded risk assessment analysis that really provides a sense of all the different types of crises um, critical incidents, complex incidents that could befall the city of Minneapolis and provides um, a way of scaling those out in terms of likelihood that they might occur and then magnitude of the impact or the crisis. And so I think that's something that is also very usable. Um, uh, recommendation 21 largely um, is, uh, falls within that section three, um, which is the um, release of public information um, under a critical incident. And so again, speaking to the city settlement agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, making sure that that section is compliant. Um, but with that, I can stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, we have a question or comment from Council Member Payne. Thank you, Vice President <clears throat> Paul Masano. Yeah, I was wondering for our crisis communications partner, Thunheim, um, What's the scope of their services? Is it to help us develop our framework for crisis communication, or are they active responders in crisis? And I'm wondering, what are the limits of what's defined as a crisis in that scenario? Sure, um, Chair Paul Masano, uh, Council Member Payne. Um, Tunheim was brought on uh, late last year as a crisis communications um, resource for the city of Minneapolis. Um, we have utilized Thunheim um, early on in some sessions to help lay the groundwork for this plan um, and to help us think through scenarios and think through the new structure to some degree at the city of Minneapolis. They have also, um, on occasion, um, we've had different situations in, within departments where we've needed some additional capacity and some additional um, expertise in a particular situation, and so they have um, come on board in, in those certain situations to help, largely for capacity. How, how formal is that? Is it just send a quick email and they'll hop on, or do you have to do some formal scoping before they'll start? Um, so they're at the ready. Uh, typically what would happen would be there, there would be some ag agreement um, that the need uh, for additional services is, is necessary, and the department um, under which, you know, might carry the budget, for instance, uh, you know, that could be CPED, that could be public works, that could be another department, um, would pay for those, um, the city attorney's office, for instance, um, would pay for some of those services, and, but it's, it's usually a collaborative, collaborative effort with um, the communications department, um, the department who the sponsoring work is originating out of, for instance, city attorney's office, um, uh, for those services and help. So then does communications hold the contract and then if a, a department needs to tap that capacity, is it kind of like a shared resource IT cost sharing arrangement or is it one master contract with communications and they Thanks. just bill their hours? Yeah, uh, Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Payne, it is a, a master contract that the city communications department, um, we do own that 
we are the contract um, holder, um, but that does allow other departments within the city who have um, a need for communications, crisis communication services kind of above and beyond our capacity at that time. And sometimes we, we are handling every day uh, different situations, but we've had some special needs. And so um, then there is, uh, they are charged, that department would be charged back for the services. Okay, I might wanna follow up with you with mm -hmm. maybe some more specific questions offline, but thank you. Thank you. And then I had some questions for uh, DC Glampy. Sure thing. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering, and it looks like, you know, some of the efforts you're doing around like the community conversations are starting to get incorporated into the after action report. I know the report was originally produced long before we had come to a final settlement with MDHR. We know we have an upcoming DOJ coming through. We know a lot of the actions or the work plan against the after action report is really training heavy. And I'm just curious how you're thinking about incorporating the whether training requirements from the MDHR settlement agreement or the you know soon consent decree with DOJ. How, how are you thinking about integrating all of those bodies of work? Uh, Chair, council member, when you take a look at, you know, one of the things we have to do, like when we talk about our use of force policy, we had to host a number of community engagement sessions to elicit specific community feedback. Um, and so we take those and as we mold our policy, which then we have to put back out for additional feedback before it's finalized, once that's done, then we're able to put it into our training, which has to be approved, as you know, by the state and by the independent evaluator who will be brought on board next year. So I think it's really taking those comments we get with what we need to put in that policy and then, you know, molding that into the training and making that truly baking it into the training. So I think that's where the integration happens with those things. So you see whether it's the after action required training or the MDHR or just consent decree, do you, would, would you see that as one integrated training plan or do you see those as kind of more parallel and separate? Um, Chair, council member, you know, it really, there's a portion of both. I, I, I think it's like a Venn diagram. You're gonna have that part in the middle that really, that molds together that you're gonna have to train on that, but there are also separate things that you can, you know, have their own lane for. So th the answer to your question is, yeah, both, really. So, um, and it, it really, yeah, it, it, again, it, there's a part that intersects and the part that's independent. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for this presentation. I'm not seeing any other um, questions or comments in queue. Director Gorman, you're standing up. Did you have any final words? All right. So seeing no further discussion, thank you for this update. It's really important. We've committed that we would publicly follow up on all of these pieces and parts. So I'll ask the clerk to file that report. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number four. Item number four is receiving and filing a report in response to a legislative directive requesting initial analysis and considerations for converting Nicollet Mall into a pedestrian plaza. Uh, we have us with us here today Kathleen Mayo from the Public Works Department to present to us on this item. Welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Mas Chair Paul Masano and committee members. My name is Kathleen Mayo. I am a Transportation Planning Supervisor in the Public Works Department and I'm happy to be reporting back on this legislative directive as we are in the early stages of exploring um, the potential Sorry, that's a little bit awkward. Um, the legislative directive put before us to look at taking transit off Nicollet Mall and converting Nicollet Mall into a pedestrian plaza. This legislative directive was given in October and we have been at work collaborating with our colleagues from Metro Transit um, on the implications of what this would mean since then. There are two major elements to consider when thinking about the idea of making Nicollet Mall a pedestrian plaza. One relates to the transit service that currently exists on Nicollet Mall, which is very robust. It's a um, long legacy of, as a transit mall within Minneapolis. And thinking about 
questions around where does transit move to and how do we support that transit service on new routes and how do we deliver a quality of transit service that is um, just as good if not better for the residents of Minneapolis and people visiting. The second part is focused on Nicollet Mall itself and how we work to make that a vibrant public plaza, looking at things like the limits of the plaza and what sort of design, operational, or programming changes we would make to Nicollet Mall to create the platform for vibrancy, you know, people gathering, all of the things that we would want to see from um, going forward with this, this change. I'm going to call on my colleague here, Kyle O'Donnell Burroughs from Metro Transit, who's been uh, partnering with us to talk through some of the transit implications. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair, Council Members. Thank you for having me here today, and thank you to Kathleen for uh, and all of the city for your collaboration with us on this on this project. Um, so, as we're all aware, um, today Nicollet Mall is one of the most important transit corridors uh, in our region, bringing thousands of people to downtown every day. Uh, it's the principal north-south uh, transit corridor in downtown, served by five routes, uh, three of which are on the high-frequency network with service every 15 minutes or better. It is also currently part of the planned alignment of the upcoming uh, Metro F-Line arterial BRT corridor, uh, serving northeast Minneapolis along Central Avenue and University Avenue, as well as the future uh, Nicollet, Ar Nicollet arterial BRT corridor, uh, serving south Minneapolis via Nicollet, Nicollet Avenue. Um, like the A-Line, C-Line, and D-Line, these future corridors uh, will provide fast, frequent service, reliable service with more comfortable shelters, including heat, light, real-time arrival information, and off-board fare payment. Bear with me on that, then. Um, so, as of course we're all aware, Nicollet Mall today is a transit mall. Uh, it has dedicated lanes for buses, Comfortable passenger waiting facilities, simple, easy to understand route design, close access to major destinations, and convenient connections to the east-west transit service through downtown, including the C-Line and D-Line and light rail services. Uh, speaking to its importance within our transit network and within uh, the overall structure of our transportation network, uh, there are more than 600 bus trips uh, per day along Nicollet Mall, which is about twice as many as any other corridor um, in our region with about nearly, <clears throat> excuse me, nearly 11,000 ons and offs occurring along the mall each day, and about 4,200 to 50, uh, 5,700 people kind of moving along or through the mall uh, by, via transit today. Um, obviously, consideration of moving transit off of the mall raises several key questions, and Metro Transit staff and City of Minneapolis staff uh, have been working very closely together uh, to define those questions and then to, to begin to answer those questions. Uh, those include thinking about um, where would existing uh, local bus service move, where would our future BRT, planned BRT service move, as well as uh, stations move to. Um, as uh, Kathleen mentioned, how do we ensure that transit service remains uh, as good or better for transit riders on Nicollet Mall today? Uh, that includes thinking about both the transit network and routing decisions, as well as thinking about improvements to uh, streets that receive uh, that would uh, receive transit if, if it were to move off of the mall, what types of roadway improvements would be needed to, to accommodate that space. And then as well, thinking about timeline for these changes, considering both those potential needed uh, street improvements, as well as other uh, planned major transit projects uh, that are underway in our region. Uh, at this point, working with City of Minneapolis staff, uh, Metro Transit, and, and the city have identified uh, four alternative corridors that were under consideration right now as alternatives if transit were to move off of the mall. Uh, those are shown here on this map. Uh, you can see uh, Hennepin Avenue, uh, Marquette and Second, that, that street, that pair uh, operating on the Mark II Express Corridor, uh, Third Avenue, and Fourth and Fifth Avenues. Uh, the city and Metro Transit staff are working very closely together to identify which of these alternatives uh, to Nicollet Mall would provide as good or better of an experience for transit riders as Nicollet, uh, as Nicollet Mall does today. 
Uh, we're considering a number of factors, including but you know, not limited to uh, thinking about the legibility of the service, directness of service, um, speed and reliability improvements of the transit service along uh, any corridor through downtown, connections to other east-west transit service through, that operate through downtown, um, access to key destinations in, in downtown, space for future BRT stations, and then the customer experience as well as perceptions of, of, any, of safety. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Kathleen for the rest of the questions. Thanks. I tried to get a little technical help. Sorry for the not flipping through the right way. Um, regarding Nicollet Mall as a public plaza, uh, there are some baseline assumptions that we would make moving forward with this. Uh, we would remain, Nicollet Mall would remain open to people walking, biking, taking different micromobility options. Um, emergency access would remain on Nicollet Mall. We would assume that the baseline um, newly reconstructed Nicollet Mall as of 2017 would by and large stay in place. There would be um, smaller scale design interventions that would both um, augment the, the ability for people to stay and linger and limit vehicle access, additional greening perhaps. Um, so these are some of the exploratory things um, also that we're thinking through. In terms of programming, um, there's, the options for this are really limitless depending on the partnerships that would um, come into effect with this. Different downtown stakeholders and organizations that already do programming on Nicollet Mall, expanding upon things like the farmer's market and such. Um, also a nice opportunity to think about consolidating different events that happen downtown, um, such as different parades and so on, races that they would, uh, consistently occur on Nicollet Mall, that would be less disruptions toward transit service across the downtown core and um, more legible for all those visitors um, in downtown when those different events do occur. And now a few um, pieces on stakeholder engagement. This is largely a forthcoming effort as we are just at the beginning of exploring some of and getting our grounding from a technical perspective about what it would mean to reroute transit off of Nicollet Mall. Um, and there really are distinct parts of this engagement process that we see. One is how do we talk about and get ideas and be in conversation around Nicollet Mall as a public plaza. And then there's another side of that, which is the transit component. And there are multiple angles there, both in terms of the local service and where that might go, um, and the BRT alignment for the planned F-line and future Nicollet BRT. We would look to, um, you know, inform riders clearly of any changes of routing, but also discuss and, and go through a design process for any underlying street improvements um, that would be associated with transit moving off of Nicollet Mall onto other downtown corridors. And there's a whole suite of stakeholders that we would engage, um, and there has been some initial conversations um, with the mayor's office as well, but just building upon different um, downtown organizations, residents, commuters, and so on, as well as transit riders being an important part of the engagement that would be forthcoming. Looking at the timeline of when these different um, activities are happening, there's a key milestone that we are working toward, and this is an April 2024 um, decision point where we would understand where the F line would be routed, um, if not on Nicollet Mall. This relates to Metro Transit's um, there are small starts Federal Transit Administration reporting requirements that they have for the F line. And so that's an annual benchmark. And so making decisions that would change the existing F line plans and um, be committing to another alignment is a really key deadline that we're hoping to, to meet. And um, that would require mutual understanding between both the city of Minneapolis and Metro Transit to where the F line's routed and then what underlying improvements on that um, corridor would also be in the works for the future. So um, concluding, you know, we're at the we're at the kind of beginning stages of the technical work, digging into the tech or we're, we're digging into the technical work, beginning stages of engagement, ongoing coordination um, with our colleagues at Metro Transit and that key April decision point on the horizon as we um, continue engaging with different stakeholders in the early parts of 2024. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have on this effort. 
Thank you. I see a few people in queue. First is Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Ms. Mayo and, and Mr. Burroughs, thank you so much for this great report, and, and it's a great start. Uh, I just want to tell you both, I'm looking you both in the eye here, this is really important to have this discussion as a city. Our, our downtown is struggling, and perhaps, just maybe, perhaps this is one way to help bring our downtown back to vitality. So thank you for the update. I look forward to ongoing discussions, and uh, perhaps uh, I might have a conversation with you privately. Uh, so, But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both for your report. Um, I do have a couple of more specific questions since this has been something that's been discussed on and off for 25 years. Um, so let me first start by saying the Mayor's Downtown Vibrant Storefronts Initiative called out removing buses on Nicollet Mall as a primary strategy. So I'm pretty confident where the Mayor is at on this, thus the administration. Just want to point that out. Two, um, when we redid Nicollet Mall, we took all the buses off the mall because of the redo of Nicollet Mall, and the world didn't come to an end. In fact, people found different places, and no one had to walk more than one block because buses were moved to Marquette and Second in one direction, some of them to Hennepin. And at that time, the Metropolitan Council um, told us that they committed to putting only hybrid buses on the mall. And they also said that the mall would have less buses than the other routes. So I'm wondering, do you know the answer to if there are hybrid buses on the mall as the primary bus system? And two, how we go from having a transit, dedicated transit lanes on Marquette and Second, removing parking, taking out curb cuts, making it more difficult for people to get to their own things there for the purpose of having a dedicated transit mall on Marquette and Second, and yet there are more buses now on Hennepin than ever, on Nicollet than ever before. So how is that inconsistent with what we've been told in years past? Because first we were told we can't do it because we'd have to pay back the federal government. So then we got a legal opinion about that and we're told that was wrong. Then we were told by Metro Transit, um, we're going to have hybrid buses. I'm going to guess it's not only hybrid buses. Then we were told, but we need Marquette in second. That's going to be our transit mall. And now there's more buses on Nicollet than there are on Marquette and second combined. So it seems like there's a bit of stonewalling here on behalf of the Metropolitan Council and Metro Transit on this issue, and I'm wondering how we're going to break through that. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman, Council Chair Palmasano. I'm going to call up Adam Harrington from Metro Transit, who can speak to both the hybrid and I think the numbers as well on yeah. Mark II. Thanks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Councilmember. I appreciate the question, and of course, we have had a lot of history on trying to figure out the best place for transit in downtown Minneapolis. And back in 2008, when we arrived at our Access Minneapolis plan for where all those routes would go, part of that scenario was moving buses off of 3rd Avenue, moving them over to Marquette and 2nd, moving express buses off of Nicollet, putting all the express buses on Marquette and 2nd. And at that time, we were pushing through 100 bus trips an hour in the rush hour and really needed that facility to help make that happen. Well, since 2020 and all the travel patterns have changed, you're right, there's a lot less service on Mark II right now as we work to get that market back, get commuters coming back to downtown Minneapolis, which we want, and the number of buses on Nicollet Mall is almost back to where it was in 2019, so there's a lot more trips today when you compare those two, but it's not as much as it was in 2019. As it relates to hybrid electric buses, uh, when we first got our order of 100 electric, hybrid electric buses, we did commit to operate them on Nickel Mall, and we have been. And so those buses are all there. It's just that that's not covering all the trips that we operate on Nickel Mall. So we've got other ultra-low sulfur diesel buses operating on the mall as well as those hybrid electric buses. And now we're looking towards different technology and testing electric buses as, as we've seen. So... It's true, there are fewer trips on Mark II today than on Nicollet Mall, and that's due to the market largely. We're hoping to have that come back, and part of our evaluation with our partners at the City of Minneapolis is to really understand what the push and pull is of where could transit go, where, where do those advantages lie, where are customers going, where are the destinations in downtown. So those are all the things we're hoping to address as part of the study working with the city. 
Thank you. Um, we hope that it will get back to the way it was as well, but there are no cities in the country that have the kind of businesses coming to their central, workers through businesses coming to their central business district anymore. So if we just sit and wait and hope that they'll come back, um, we will be in for a very rude awakening. And now there is capability to move to Marquette in second. And I just don't understand why we wouldn't almost immediately be thinking that through because we won't have hardly anyone coming back if we can't revitalize Nicollet Mall. That's just the bottom line. Nicollet Mall is Maine and Maine. And if we just can't have that, if that doesn't turn into something different, then we have even less chance, in my opinion, of that. So um, I, I'm just curious about, we had heard Metro Transit was interested in this, but it doesn't sound really like you are. So can you just share with me the level of interest for Metro Transit in doing this? Or do we need to go to the legislature? What do we need to do if Metro Transit says, no, they're not gonna do it? Madam Chair, Council Member, uh, we are absolutely committed to evaluating these options and taking it very seriously. And I'll say we've got a really good partnership with staff and so part of this is that community engagement with not only our partners in downtown at the business level, but also our customers and understanding where that balance is between the options as uh, Mr. Burroughs presented earlier on the map. So we absolutely are committed to giving a fair evaluation of this in partnership with the city. Can, um, maybe I should ask, um, I don't know who in the administration can give me a sense of the hierarchy of this. Thank you, Mr. Harrington, you probably are not the person. Um, who gets to make the ultimate decision about whether or not buses go on Nicollet Mall or Marquette and Second? Is that the city or is that Metro Transit through the power of the state? Because we just had our two transportation chairs here and if I had thought we were gonna get this much pushback, I would have asked them to stay for this conversation. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I hope this isn't viewed as pushback on the idea. We're really taking it through a process. I understand uh, the view of it may seem obvious when you look at what's happening on the streets today. Uh, but the council does have statutory authority to operate on any street in the city of Minneapolis or in the region except for Minneapolis Parkways without so, approval. So we would have to get a state law change in order to direct the outcome that we would prefer. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I really hope that that is not necessary at all and uh, I just will vouch for our true partnership in trying to evaluate what the options are and we're not ready here today to say what we're going to be doing because we're in the middle of that analysis right yeah, now. That's fair. I, I get that. Um, I also just want to ask staff um, to please consider when you're talking about uh, the engagement of stakeholders that there are four neighborhoods downtown, not one. Uh, Loring Park has a big chunk of Nicollet Mall in, in the Loring Park neighborhood, as does the Elliott Park neighborhood and the North Loop neighborhood. And I see on this list of engagement, um, none of the other neighborhoods are included. So I just want to no blame, I'm just saying please include them. I'm quite sure that people who live south end of Nicollet Mall who have seen the greatest reduction in business workers, greatest reduction in restaurants, greatest reduction in property values, greatest reduction in rejuvenation of downtown would have very strong feelings about increasing the ability for restaurants and other entertainment venues to be closer to them. And, and they're not on this list. So just I'd ask you kindly to include that. Councilmember Goodman, Chair Palmasano, absolutely. Uh, my fault they're not on the slide. Absolutely, we haven't done the engagement yet. We, would, we will absolutely engage with all residents of downtown um, and the neighborhoods surrounding. It, it's an important corridor for the residents, an important corridor for the transit riders as well, and we'll be, we'll be doing all of that. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thank you for the report. Thank you for turning it around so quickly. Um, I think our, we, we weren't sure if our legislative directive was going to get us anything back by the end of the year, and we're very grateful for that, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanna just add that I hope that as we continue this conversation in public, um, I, I was struggling, and though I think this last part of the conversation gave me some context for, that, for this, um, is that what, what problem are we solving here in this initiative? And, and what have we learned from the past iterations of Nicollet Mall? And those are just, those aren't questions to answer right now, right here, but um, I'm, I'm getting the sense that the problems that we're solving or the opportunity here is to really showcase this corridor, that it's about rejuvenization, that it's about an opportunity for revitalization in a different way than it can be having large buses on it. Um, if it's more than that, I hope that my colleagues can maybe um, illustrate that for me. 
Um, the question that I do have, though, that's pertinent for this moment is do you have plans yet on how you will do that engagement work um, so that we can invite people to participate? Council Chair Palmisano, um, at the moment we don't have the engagement strategy outlined. We do know we've been focusing on some of the technical work to date um, with the intent that certainly between the new year and April there will be some engagement and we will certainly share that information and um, ask for the help of the council to help uh, encourage engaging with our residents and, sure. and getting the word out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else in queue, so I will um, say, I'll ask the clerk to please file that report. And thank you, thank you, Kyle, for coming from Metro Transit for this conversation. Um, moving on, our fifth and final item before we move on to our committee reports, is receiving and filing an update in regards to 3000 Minnehaha Avenue, that's the, our former third precinct building, and to provide recommendations for preferred uses of non-city program space. I, I think that actually this is a presentation being given about the future and the use study of 3000 Minnehaha. So um, I'll turn it over to Matt Hannon. Thank you. Chair Palmisano, members of the committee, my name is Matt Hannon uh, with Finance Property Services. Um, I'm gonna get started with the first portion of the presentation on the potential reuse of the 3000 Minnehaha site and Alexander Cato will take over uh, later on in the presentation to talk about the engagement process there. So uh, this presentation will go through the process uh, that property services use to evaluate potential reuse options for the 3000 Minnehaha Avenue site. <clears throat> In the interest of being fiscally responsible, property services first looks at ways to reuse existing city owned property before selling. City ordinance outlines uh, the process that the city must follow for property that is excess and no longer needed for municipal operations or service. Before any unused city property can be declared as excess, we must first determine potential needs and evaluate options for reuse. If no reuse options are identified and the property is declared as excess, there's a disposition policy in place for selling municipal operations property. The following slides show the criteria used to review the potential city needs and to determine possible reuse options for the site. This slide shows the general location of the site. The site generally referred to as 3000 Minnehaha uh, is comprised of two parcels separated by a public alley. 3000 Minnehaha is the northernmost parcel uh, that fronts Lake Street, Snelling Avenue, and Minnehaha Avenue. 3033 Snelling Avenue uh, only fronts on Snelling Avenue. 3000 Minnehaha is an irregularly shaped parcel consisting of about 0.8 acres. There's a three-story shell building on the site that's approximately 40,000 square feet. In its current configuration, the parking lot has 48 spaces, and the parcel is zone CM4, or community mixed use. Thirty thirty three Snelling is a surface parking lot, uh, approximately 0.65 acres in size. There are currently no buildings on the site. The parking lot has 86 parking spaces, and the parcel is zone CM3, or community mixed use. This slide is a summary of the overall site attributes. Uh, the combined size of both parcels is about one and a half acres or 64,000 square feet. Uh, three level shell building on the site again, as mentioned, is about 40,000 square feet. And overall, there are 134 parking spaces between the two parcels. Site access is available from Lake Street, Snelling Avenue, and the alley on the site, but uh, the site's currently only accessed from the alley. Given the recent events in and around this location, redevelopment on this site is a sensitive subject to Minneapolis residents. Earlier this year, City Council passed Action 2023A-0492, 
which affects the future use of the site for any police-related functions. As part of this process, we considered the existing site attributes and council action regarding future use. We reviewed the projects in the capital budget request list in our existing leased spaces to see if we could find potential candidates for reuse of the 3000 Minnehaha Avenue site. After reviewing the list of proposed capital budget requests, we were able to identify five as potential options for relocation to the 3000 Minnehaha site. These include public works tra traffic facility, the farmer's market, animal care and control, the proposed Hiawatha training facility, and a water, uh, relocated water east yard. We also looked at our current lease space portfolio to see if any of these functions might into the, fit into this space as well. Our general practice has been to move away from lease space into city-owned facilities wherever possible to minimize financial impact. Many of these leases are location specific or serve a particular purpose like storage that's not in line with this property classification. After reviewing the various lease spaces, uh, only the election of voter services lease was determined to be a potential option. After that, we evaluated which of these potential reuses would be allowed at the 3000 Minnehaha site under both the old zoning code and the 2040 land use rezoning plan. The zoning of the 3000 Minnehaha site uh, is C3A under the old code or CM3, CM4 under the 2040 plan. The Water East Yard and Border Avenue maintenance facilities would not be permitted at this location under either zoning code and the MAC facility or the animal care and control facility would be allowed under the old code but not the 2040 plan. Zoning requirements eliminate two of the potential uses and depending on, on the fate of the uh, 2040 plan, a third animal care and control might also be eliminated. This leaves just the farmer's market, the Hiawatha training facility, and election and voter services as more likely candidates based on zoning. In the next few slides, we'll look at some of the characteristics of these existing sites, as well as some of the pros and cons of moving these functions to the 3000 Minnehaha site. The farmer's market property is an approximately two acre site. Uh, there are three metal canopies that span the width of the property, but no enclosed structures on the site. There are 170 vendor stalls on the property and the current configuration contains 23 parking spaces on the south side, not counting vendor parking throughout the site. There's been increasing demand for an indoor market space to better serve residents year round. And there's a current CIP plan for enclosed structures for the farmer's market on this existing site. Some of the advantages to relocating the farmer's market to 3000 Minnehaha are that the existing parking lot would uh, provide plenty of parking. Uh, it's convenient to light rail and other public transportation. Disadvantages, there's uh, abundant fresh food sources available near the 3000 Minnehaha site already. Uh, the site is smaller than the existing farmer's market and it would require major renovation or demolition. Minneapolis Animal Care and Control is located at 1705 2nd Street North. The property is used for both nuisance animal housing as well as pet adoption. The current site is approximately 0.8 acres. Uh, there's a one-story building that contains approximately 21,000 square feet. A master planning effort is currently underway to assist animal care and control with determining options to expand the building by 10,000 square feet. There's a need to separate the pet adoption site from the nuisance animal holding area. Some advantages to relocating animal care and control. The existing building is large enough to allow for both uh, pet adoption and animal holding area. And additional space uh, could be available for potential multi-use partnership there. Disadvantages include that the 2040 land use plan, as mentioned earlier, doesn't allow for the use on the site and the site is larger than needed for a standalone adoption center. 
Elections and Voter Services is currently located at a leased building at 980 East Hennepin. The operation is divided between two adjacent buildings on the site, uh, and there are three different leased spaces. The leases for all three spaces terminate on November 30, 2029. The largest space is currently at a rate that's substantially below market, but would return to market rate if the lease is extended beyond 2029. The combined building area that Elections is using is approximately 25,000 square feet. Uh, there are 52 designated parking spaces available during election times, but otherwise there's a large open lot shared by tenants and guests of the building. Election and Voter Services is currently looking at ways to consolidate all of their functions into one space. Advantages to relocating elections to 3000 Minnehaha include it's again convenient to light rail and public transportation, plenty of existing parking between the two uh, parcels, Existing building has adequate space for election and voter services needs. It would eliminate approximately $376,000 in annual lease cost, and again, that lease would escalate uh, going beyond 2029. And it could provide flexible space uh, for potential multi-use partnership. Disadvantages for this are that the cost for construction uh, would need to be added to a future year CIP program and the remaining lease would need to be bought out or taken over for use by another city department. Based on the proposed design work, the Hiawatha training facility would require approximately 1.4 acres of land to accommodate the 34,000 square foot building and 64 parking spaces. The space would primarily be training and conference room, uh, and there's also a proposal for open meeting space for community use as well. Some advantages uh, to relocating the Hiawatha training facility, proposed training facility. Again, it would be convenient to light rail and public transportation. Uh, existing site and building meet the proposed design size requirements, be in close proximity to other public works locations, including the existing Hiawatha facility. And again, potential for multi-use partnership for additional space. Disadvantages of this are that it would be disconnected from the existing Hiawatha campus. When we take all these factors into consideration, there are at least two potential reuse options for the 3000 Minnehaha Avenue site. Based on our evaluation, the city does have space needs that this property would be able to fulfill. Based on our evaluation of the site and the current city needs, Property Services recommends that the 3000 Minnehaha Avenue site be repurposed for elections and voter services. Locating elections and voter services at 3000 Minnehaha would make their services more accessible. This slide just illustrates uh, some of the services that election and voter services provides. The existing building would meet the needs of elections and voter services and additional space would be available for community use. Also during non-election times, other portions of the space could potentially be made available for community use or use by other city departments. The next step would include conducting a fit plan for election services, which would result in a clearer understanding of the programmable community space. Early space estimates forecast approximately eight to 10,000 square feet for community programming. And uh, this represents about 25% of the available space in that building. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Alexander to talk a little bit about the engagement process. Should we hold questions until the end then? This is the last Okay, let's go through it all and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so uh, thank you, Matt, for going over the, the process that Finance and Property Services went through. Um, this would also be included, would be an engagement process. Uh, in January 24, we're planning to do an engagement event to share uh, this information that was presented to you all with community um, to give them um, a chance to answer questions and better understand the process. And we'd also at that point outline the community engagement process for the spring. 
Um, the, oh, and then we'd report back to Cal in March um, to, to refine that process. The engagement process in the spring and the summer would be um, monthly meetings to design that community space. Um, as my colleague Matt mentioned, about a quarter of the building would be open for community input and design. Uh, we'd like to go through that process, explore the options, and kind of figure out how that space would marry with the, the primary use of the building. Um, there'd also be an opportunity to explore um, just kind of the entrance, artistic elements, how the, the history of, of that building and the murder of George Floyd is memorialized within that building and entrances. Um, and then in the fall would be a final report um, to de deliver to city council. Uh, that is the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, more than willing to take questions from the council. Thank you. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. I, uh, I first want to acknowledge that today, this isn't the city making a decision. This is the city presenting information around a, a framework for getting to a decision, right? Um, and then the second thing I want to acknowledge is if we were to make this decision today, there are a series of financial, legal, land use constraints that thereby arrive us at certain uses over others. In this case, you're recommending the use of, um, not you, Mr. Cato, but the city is recommending uh, the, the use for uh, election services. Uh, I'm curious, uh, maybe this would be a question better for uh, COO Johnston. Um, as we're looking at the current landscape around the constraints, whether it's our capital improvement plan, our you know, property services policies, um, what are some of the bigger levers that we would want to look at as council as we're thinking about potential uses for this building? Because one of the discussions we had during our briefing was um, the community engagement was gonna be around the program space for the community but because of the constraints of our, our policies, um, voter services was rising to the top as one of the best uses for this asset. Um, if the community felt that there was a different thing that they would want to see, but our policies are a barrier, what, what kind of, what are the biggest barriers? Is it zoning? Is it our capital planning? Um, is it our ordinance specifying city uses of buildings? because we actually have the ability to change those constraints if our community demands it. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Johnson. Uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member Payne, it, that, the answer to that is it depends. I mean, if you, for example, um, you couldn't now have the city a city-owned facility and have private uses in there, that would violate the public purpose um, doctrine and that state statute, that's not something in, within the council's power to change. Um, so what we have done is we have looked at the existing ordinance, the existing zoning, as you heard, both um, uh, you know, both comprehensive plans, and some some of that is currently in doubt. Um, I would imagine that you would want to balance all of the different pieces. I mean, one constraint I think some folks would say is financial. I mean, this is obviously something where um, you know reuse. We look at reuse of existing facilities and getting out of rental space because it both balances. The financial, um, the financial obligations of the city, and um, saves the taxpayers money that would be better, or I shouldn't say better spent, would could be spent on other program activities that the council would be um, would prefer. Um, and so, in terms of other constraints, certainly there there's the balancing that you the council has to do on all different pieces um, of that. So. I mean, those are some of them. I could stay, um, I know you all have another meeting at 6.05, so I won't sit here and um, get, say all of them, but um, those are some of the major ones in my opinion. But the, uh, the key takeaway here is some of these constraints are within our control, but some of them aren't with our, in our control. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Payne, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, uh, Vice President. Um, interim, you could stay up at the platform. I got a couple questions. Um, so first question I know that I get from my constituents a lot is when can we expect to see the fences be, actually this might be for Director O'Brien too, uh, um, 
uh, when we can expect to see site cleanup that includes the removal of fences. I know that's come up in some of our briefings before. I thought it was also included in the timeline, at maybe a previous update, but just wanted to get an estimate. I, I thought that was happening spring of next year, but wanted to get clarification. Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley, thank you for the question. I'll answer it, and if you want more details, the answer is spring of next year. So we are um, currently working on that, uh, uh, Director <laughs> O'Brien is doing that, um, and so as soon as this, we hope to start working, not, we're starting work now, um, but hope to have that done uh, when the snow is gone, so okay. in the spring. So okay. spring is amorphous. Spring of 2024. Correct. Sounds good. And then next question, I raised this in my briefing too, but can you lay out, um, is there any legal prohibitions around uh, a selling the site to a, a private uh, developer or it basically, yeah, is there a pathway to sell this independently? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Wansley, um, you would have to go through the normal procurement processes. You would probably want to do a, an RFP process. We would go, follow our normal um, development processes that are consistent with our um, ordinances and our, the, with respect to zoning, as well as other um, considerations in your comprehensive plan that you all have adopted. Oh, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Councilmember Koski. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I just had a quick question about the community uh, benefits work group, and because um, that's my understanding too, is that we are adopting the formation of that. Could you just? Actually, we're not. Um, so oh. after more discussion, as staff presented and gave those briefings to all of us as colleagues, there wasn't. Um, a lot of agreement as to how that would form or what that would take place, which is why, and Alexander Cato can share more, that at this point, is we're not sure what that next step looks like. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, we're doing engagement in January to, to share this information publicly. Right now, we're leaning towards, um, for the spring and summer, having monthly community, community design meetings to define that space, the quarter of the building. But at, at this moment, we're not recommending um, a work group. Okay, thank you. I did see the receiving filing and I got a little confused because I thought that we there was a recommendation of how the work group was going to be um, you know, formed and I'm grateful to hear that we're just taking a pause and mm -hmm. continuing those conversations. So that's all. That's great. Yep. Thanks. I think that, um, Mr. Cato, I think that if I'm not mistaken, hopefully when we're ready to have those conversations, we would have a better sense of the scope of that space that we can make available, is that correct? That's correct. Um, I, I believe shortly after this, Finance and Property Services is gonna be performing a fit plan on the building um, with the identified primary use. It'll give us a better sense of what remaining space we have. Right now we're estimating a quarter of the building, eight to 10,000 square feet. Um, but yeah, you are correct with that statement. Thank you. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I initially thought I was after Councilmember Chavez, but um, you know, I was just going to make the comment. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of interest in this space, um, but the idea of a center for democracy seems really intriguing uh, to have our elections and civic engagement and particularly in a community that um, many times sees very low voter turnout, et cetera. So um, just wanted to add that thought. Thank you. Thank you for the recommendation. Thank you. Council Member Chavez. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Palmasano. Just to be clear, the council hasn't given direction that we are asking for this to be an election and voter services area. There isn't anything being moved or forwarded with this presentation. And I guess it's for COO Johnson, a question for you that I have as well. I think my concern is that after today, we got a presentation and then somehow there's gonna be designs, some direction that the mayor might be having or be giving you to move forward on some type of election or voter services, even if the council hasn't given direction. So I'm kind of confused if you can clarify what are the next steps. Uh, 
Chair Palmasano, Council Member Chavez, um, the next step is to um, have a public meeting in uh, January to help educate the public on kind of our process that we followed and um, what the recommendations are with respect to the primary use and to um, begin that engagement process with respect to uh, secondary uses. And so in terms of uh, direction, um, we've been given direction to uh, present this information to you all today. So that's what we are doing. Um, this is not, as I've said before, this is not a process. Normally, this this happens behind the scenes, as you heard. Given given um, the history of the site, we wanted to make sure that we were fully transparent for the public, so that they understand that um, what the, the options are, including the the benefits um, of having um, the elections and voter services at this site. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So. Um, just to clarify, council doesn't give permission to take this action or not. Um, this is a property disposition process, and so we won't be taking a vote on that decision uh, ever. There will obviously be oversight kinds of things that come to committee as we invest more money in the reopening of, of this property. Um, council President Jenkins. Oh, I said, did well, I? thank you. I, I was just... I'm looking at a timeline, and I thought that was the timeline for engagement, et cetera. Is that accurate? Mr. Cato? Yeah, correct. This is the timeline we are proposing, um, and we're using the January event to share this information, um, come back to Committee of the Whole in March of 24 before we proceed with that work. The timeline you see on the screen is the proposed engagement timeline for this body of work. Great, thank you so much. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. To be clear, I mean, this isn't just a random situation. The Minneapolis Police Department murdered a black man. So this isn't just a regular circumstance that we're sitting here today. I think the reality is that it feels like we're being told that 75% of this building is being used for election and voter services, and that the council has no authority authority over that. That is not true. We are the power of the purse, and we have the ability to uh, amend the ordinance that is telling us that we're gonna use the majority of this building for election and voter services. So I just reject that premise to begin with. I think that we need to do engagement, real authentic engagement in this process, not say, what are you gonna use these 25% of the building for? And I think this is gonna be something this body is gonna to have to work on to make sure that the use of this building is actually something that the community wants. The community has not asked that they want this for election of voter services, to be clear. They just have not, that's not something they're asking for. And we need to dive deep into what people actually want, what city service potentially they want in that corner, and then what community use is gonna to be to the benefit of the people there. So, just saying, we need to take action on this, but it's not gonna become election of voter services unless the community wants that. Okay, just to be clear though, this is a receive and file action today. We're not taking action on anything today. Um, but the engagement next steps timeline slide, just again to clarify, is about the engagement on the extra community use portion of this facility, not on the part that would be needed for another city function. Um, Councilmember Charity. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in our briefing, we had a discussion, um, our briefing on the site, there was a discussion about, yeah, typically the city council would not um, even get a briefing on the use of a site, right? And that's an acknowledgement that this is an ex extraordinary circumstance. We are talking about a building where um, we saw immense devastation and trauma in our community from many different perspectives, and we are talking about shifting it into a different use, and it is really incumbent on me coming to this dais and talking to my community that um, when we look back at our city's history and uh, the history of the murder of George Floyd is detailed, um, the history of the building burning, the history of police officers standing atop the building and shooting projectiles is discussed, the, the history 
of everything that follows is laid out. We are also going to read the history of what the building became and how the community was a part of that. And I really want us to be on the right side of history on that one. And so while I do understand that we usually don't get briefings on such matters and we don't get to participate, this is a very different circumstance and it's an opportunity for us as a city to really um, do the right thing here and figure out how we can collaborate with community and empower their voice in what this process looks like. Uh, I was taking a look at the race equity impact analysis that's required um, in uh, all RCAs that are brought to the city request for actions that are brought forward to the city council. And they're on the in, in community engagement portion um, involve and consult were checked off, but uh, collaborate and empower were not checked off. And I think in our briefing, there was a short discussion that community was somewhat engaged in determining, um, how, in, determ in determining the voter and election services. I didn't get full clarity on what that engagement looked like. Uh, that there were some discussions with community groups, which they're not. Uh, I thought there was a discussion with our Longfellow Community Council. No? Okay. Well, um, for me, I would really like to see that the crux of the issue for me as a council member that is representing the third precinct is many community members in my ward described to me that there was an expectation that they would be involved in a discussion around what the primary function of this building would be. And in January, we were presenting them with the primary function without their voice being a part of it. Um, I'm glad to see that there's going to be uh, some part of it that will belong to the community, but I think we are potentially not setting ourselves up for success to do the right thing here if we are coming to the community with an idea already baked for the primary function. And I would be really remiss if I didn't make these comments here today as we're getting this presentation on uh, 3000 Mini Haha -ha and sharing it with our colleagues here on the dais that um, uh, don't represent the third precinct. I just thought I would bring that perspective and voice of community members here that I've heard. Thank you. Are there any other people that would like to ask a question or provide comment? I'm not seeing any. Uh, I'll go ahead and direct the clerk to please file this report. Um, last but not least, we have the reports from standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this Thursday. Um, I think we can probably breeze through these and everybody can go and read the committee reports. It was an unusually busy cycle, as is typical to the last cycle of a term. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin with the budget committee chaired by Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The budget committee is bringing two items to the Thursday's council meeting. Number one is COVID employee leave program extension, and number two is 2024 appointed, non-represented, and politically appointed employees' salary schedules. I will stand for questions. Thank you. Next is the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee, chaired by Councilmember Goodman. Um, the Biz Committee is bringing forward 31 items, just so everyone knows. Item number one is the consent of the mayor's nomination of Eric Hansen. Item two is approving an application uh, for extended hours for McDonald's and Dinkytown. Item three is for the Huge Theater. Item four is for the Kenwood. Item five is for GIA. Item six is for Berlin. And item seven is for Bina's. These are all liquor-related um, expansion of premise or sidewalk cafes. Item number eight is uh, the TIF plan for 3030 Nicolet. Council President will be happy to hear that, as will be Council Member Chugtai, which is in her ward. Item number nine is an interim use permit at Malcolm Yards. Item 10 is the body art ordinance. Item 11 is a pedicab ordinance. Item 12 is a variance appeal. Item 13 is findings for nuisance conditions. Item 14 are liquor license approvals. 15 are the renewals. 16 are the gambling license approvals. 17 are the spring brownfield grants from the Met Council. 
18 is a grant application for employment and training. 19 is uh, appointments to the Workforce Development Board. 20 is a legislative directive regarding labor standards enforcement. 21 is the deadline, a deadline extension for a forgivable loan. Item 22 is a legislative director on the TNC minimum compensation models. 23 is the housing advisory committee appointments. 24 is the public housing appointments. 25 are about $10 million worth of grants under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Item 26 is a reservation of our low-income housing tax credits. Item 27 has to do with the regulation of tobacco. You might have been getting some emails about this. Item 13 is a window cleaning ordinance. 29 is a uh, rental dwelling pre-leasing ordinance. This is the work from Councilmember Wansley uh, after the issues at the identity at Dinkytown. And item 13 is granting in part and denying a part, in part variances at 5005 Lindale Avenue South. And item 31 are the Great Streets program funding awards. I'm happy to answer questions on any of those items. I do realize there are a lot. It took two meetings uh, over two days to get through all the items. Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, let my colleagues know that I'll be bringing an amendment forward on Thursday to the tobacco ordinance. I'm trying to work for a one-year extension with sampling based on all of the, the emails and the concerns that we've got from folks. So that'll come forward on Thursday. Thank you. All right. Anything else about biz committee? I'm not seeing any policy and government oversight committee chaired by council member Ellison. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The policy and government oversight committee is bringing forward 36 items. Uh, I read the full list at committee, and I'll be reading the full list in detail at the um, at the full council. But I'll sort of take us through. Item number one is a uh, is a gift acceptance. Item number two is a HUD community project funding grant application and acceptance for North Commons Park Improvement Project. Um, item number three is approving capital long range um, improvement committee appointments. Items four through twenty. <clears throat> uh, nine are you know our various bids and um, uh, and uh, contract authorizations. Most of it for either road construction or software updates. Um, item number three, uh, thirty. Sorry, is a legal settlement. Uh, Kenesha Gilmer versus the City of Minneapolis and John Vink. Uh, Thirty-one is a legal settlement. Yalima uh, are. are Arguillo versus the city of Minneapolis. 32, 33, 34, and 35 are workers' compensation claims, um, three of which were uh, forwarded without recommendation. Um, and then item number six is a uh, master contract um, in, uh, for climate, energy, and sustainability services. Uh, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any. Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee chaired by Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward 19 items. Item one is the passage of an ordinance amending provisions related to the neighborhood revitalization program. Item two is the passage of an ordinance removing stigmatizing language from the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to high-risk sexual conduct. Item three is approving appointments to the homegrown Minneapolis Food Council. Item four is accepting a grant to address regional drug threats. Item five is accepting a National Forensic Sciences Improvement Grant from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Item six is accepting a community-oriented policing services hiring grant from the U.S. Department of Justice. Item seven is authorizing an amendment to the Joint Powers Agreement with the Minnesota BCA for Human Trafficking Investigations Crime Analyst Support. Item eight is authorizing a contract with the City of Crystal for traffic enforcement for the state's Toward Zero Death Program. Item nine is accepting a grant from the Office of Justice Programs for a student internship program with the Police Department. Item 10 is accepting a hazardous materials emergency preparedness grant for hazmat training and incidents response. 
Item 11 is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Division of Homeland Security to prepare for emergencies and disasters. Item 12 is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Division of Homeland Security to enhance emergency management capabilities. Item 13 is accepting a grant from the Medica Foundation for an anti-stigma campaign and pilot on the site substance use disorder project. Item 14 is accepting a grant amendment from the Minnesota Department of Health for implementation of evidence-based family home visiting services. Item 15 is amending a previous council action related to contracts with organizations for the Partnership Engagement Fund. Item 16 is the passage of a resolution to support the formation of Longfellow Community Energy, Inc. Item 17 is a contract for service agreement with the Hennepin County to respond to the social determinants of health. Item 18 is a food matters grant from the Natural Resources Defense Council to support creation of four videos for food waste prevention. And item 19 is a joint powers agreement between the City of Minneapolis, Special School District Number 1, the Park and Recreation Board in Hennepin County related to the Youth Coordinating Board. I'll stand for any questions on these items. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll also just briefly mention that, unless you already have, I got pulled away here, um, that there might be, there will be some updates to that um, ordinance um, to come Thursday that is specifically about, and we're always going to get the name wrong, but the NRP policy board ordinance changes. Yes. Um, and we just got that during this meeting in our email. Um, so happy to socialize that with others before the meeting on Thursday. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, chaired by Council Member Koski. Uh, I will. Uh, I, Madam Chair, I'll present this, um, this committee's report. Uh, the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is going to be bringing forward 14 items. Um, I am sure that members will have a chance to go through the committee's report. And if you have any questions, either myself or Council Member Koski are happy to answer those. I will note, though, that item number 13, which was updates to the parking and mobility services fee and rate schedule, was sent forward without recommendation. The rest I will be moving um, for approval on Thursday and happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Finally, we have the audit committee. We do have two items being brought forward from this week's audit committee, and it is simply directing the city clerk to transmit letters to the appropriate agencies within the state of Minnesota for our regular biennial body-worn camera audits and license plate reader audits. Um, both of those will be going through as appropriate on Thursday. Uh, are there any other items coming from committees that people want to make others aware of for Thursday. I'm not seeing any, so we've finally concluded all business to come before our last committee of the whole of this term. Thank you for your patience, and without any objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So,